True fact, Germans love Shadowrun. In terms of money and market share, Germany is probably one of Shadowrun's biggest cash cows. A significant portion of Shadowrun's worldwide player base are German. If you are in a Shadowrun game online, chances are one of the players is German. There are two German Shadowrun wikis, and even when it comes to describing the American, English, international parts of the setting, they all blow the international wiki out of the water. There is a significant number of supplement books written in German and never published in English. Now granted, these do primarily pertain to Germany, and this kind of book exists in some other languages as well, but the question remains, why so much in Germany? Like, why do Germans of all people seem to love Shadowrun more than anyone else in the world? It's not like we live in a particular cyberpunk dystopia. Germany is a wealthy welfare state. We've got strong labor unions and fucking consumer protections, a robust healthcare system. There's no shortage of problems, of course. There's no, like, lack of weird dystopian bullshit going on. But but even compared to most of the industrialized world, we're in a pretty good spot. Or could it be that this kind of thing is exactly what makes Shadowrun too real for the rest of the world? I mean, that's just like pointless armchair psychology. No, the real actual reason is that Germany seems to be the only country in the whole world where D&D does not corner literally 99% of the RPG market. Because Shadowrun isn't the only RPG that isn't D&D that is enjoys huge and disproportional popularity in Germany. And the reason for this is that D&D, uh, &D, back when it originally came out, the very first edition, really dragged its feet when it came to releasing a German version of the game. And the thing is, even back in the 80s, when a lot of Germans obviously spoke English, just like they do now, even more of them, but back then already they, we had a tendency to expect, and we still do have a tendency to expect, everything in terms of media internationally to come to us fully localized. Not just translated, but localized. Which makes sense really, because especially if you count Austria and the German-speaking parts of Switzerland, where you can also then distribute those things, you have like a hundred million people speaking German in what is essentially some of the wealthiest nations in human history. The so German nerds brought the game D&D to the country, but because it wasn't localized, a lot of bootstrapping and jury rigging happened to make it our own. The homebrew culture was very established very quickly. And only a year after the official German localization of D&D came out, The Dark Eye, Germany's response to D&D, which had been floating around in, like ghost versions all throughout the role-playing sphere, entered the market. Pair this with the fact that other systems very much did not drag their feet when it came to releasing a German localization for their games, and the situation that you have is a world where D&D &D doesn't have 15 years of being the only thing that exists in the role-playing space without anything else as competition. The German role-playing culture very much started out with the idea ingrained that it's not just normal, but expected for you to be playing different systems. In fact, if you only play one system, let's face it, usually that system is D&D, people will look at you weird. That's a, that's a strange and myopic thing to do. And also, uh, we don't call it D&D, &D, we don't call it TTRPGs, although some people do, the most common term is pen and paper games, like the English term pen and paper spiele. That is what happens when you have actual competition. And so, because there's a lot of German law that uh, English-speaking Shadowrun players do not have access to, let's talk about that a little bit, by which I mean a very extended period of time. Oh, and if you're very confused right now and have no idea what Shadowrun even is, but you're still watching the video for some reason, I have a whole playlist, I have a video where it like starts out with the 101 basics of Shadowrun lore and then it goes on with a bunch of other videos that I also made that explain pretty much all the basic concepts of Shadowrun that you need to understand. Fair warning though! It's mostly pre-beard burger. First things first, let's talk about the historical circumstances that led to the existence of Germany as it is presented in the Shadowrun universe, because they really did their due diligence with this. So to go back quite a bit, uh, Germany has 
throughout history been often a like not always clearly defined phenomenon that popped in and out of existence like gradually throughout time people think of the germans as this ancient civilization but that's really just because the romans called all of the people in that area the germans the reality is that germany has always been a vast and complex tapestry of different clans tribes and peoples in fact Natural terms for much of history, especially in like the late Roman to post-Roman period, Germany was just kind of the place where like there was sort of in the middle of Europe and a lot of people passed through it and hung out there for a while. Until of course the Holy Roman Empire, which wasn't any of those three things really. And it really, it, the, the reason they call it Roman is because of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, which is the one that the spaceship in Matrix is named after, he had a dream? about how there was only going to be like a limited amount of empires throughout time and so they called it Roman so it wouldn't count as an extra empire and like postpone the end of the world. You know back when Christians were about like postponing the end of the world? People think of that as the unification of Germany, like the first real unification which it very much was not. Though for the purposes of creating a German national identity, centuries later, it very much became that, retrospectively. Charlemagne didn't create the Germany. He had a Roman, Holy Roman Empire that just so happened to overlap with a lot of the territories of a lot of Germanic-speaking peoples that could vaguely understand each other. There's lots of maps. Uh, you probably know that the Holy Roman Empire existed for like a thousand years of war and peace and like prosperity and crisis, uh, repression and innovation, and it changed shape a lot during that time. But you all know the, the classic look, especially in what is modern day Germany, just the degree of fracturing is like a tipped over China cabinet. And the reason for this is twofold. For one, and perhaps most importantly, Germany has always been a pretty geographically divided country. There's, there's a lot of rivers, a few lakes, mountain ranges that are, you know, not impossible, but certainly rather difficult to traverse. This is also why the country has never had like like a single beating economic heart, which for most countries around the world is their capital. Maybe there are one, two other cities that are important for the economy, but even they are sort of created to supplicate to the core of it where all of the money is made. London, Paris, Cairo. Germany has always had to be much more decentralized. It has from the very beginning had it much more of a, of a complex weave of trade relations, which it turns out creates a lot of distributed economic power in a lot of different places, and is also pretty fucking stable. And of course, when we became real good at like shipping and building bridges, those rivers became a huge economic advantage. The other reason is that for the longest time, there really wasn't much of a German national or like common identity. Outsiders started calling them the Teutons and the Germans and the Alamans fr from a very early age, but that's just some people do to grab like any group of people that live in the same area and speak a vaguely similar language and lump them together. That doesn't mean those people really identify with each other all that much. Remember, this was feudalism time, so while people and people groups were, like, recognized informally and among each other, it was something that people knew about and something that people thought about. The things that constituted countries are very much not the things that constitute countries as we imagine them today. They were arranged by the ancestral claims and feudal landholding agreements of noble aristocratic families. Realms that existed were much more frequently named after major cities in them, or just the noble families that ruled them. Sometimes the names of the bloodlines eventually became, and still are today, the names of the regions. You might have a, an identity as a German people group member. You would be Palatine, or you would be Hesse. But that doesn't really mean much, and you most certainly wouldn't be fucking German. What even? That's just, that's a language. What, am I a fucking Esperanti because I... Like, know a little bit of Esperanto? Then eventually, as modernity rolled around, an idea started to enter the heads of many Germans, which was, hang on, maybe, like, we, we do kinda all speak the same language? 
And that's also a thing, like, other countries also, they also have, like, a language. And maybe they are right, and we are, like, one people of different groups. Because that's true about them also. And then, of course, eventually nationalism enters the stage, which is the idea that a nation can exist legitimately by virtue of it being made up of a certain region and the people that live there, as opposed to the divine claim of a royal bloodline. It can just exist because the people decided it exists. This is why Germany has always been a federalized state. It's a, an alliance of peoples that share together in the common identity of having the same language that we all speak. That's really the key bit that makes Germans German, the language. Because there's a lot of different people groups in this country, and there have been for millennia. So to skip a great many things, the iteration of Germany, when the Shadowrun timeline takes over, which is 1989, the year it came out, one year before German reunification of East and West Germany, that was the Federal Republic of Germany. That it was clear at that point, like, y you know, fuck, come on, it's gonna be, it's gonna be the, the one in the West. And that's also still the state that is IRL Germany today. Spoiler alert, it is not the German state that is Germany in Shadowrun times, but we'll get to that. I mention this because of course the, the major event that makes Shadowrun different as a setting from our world is the emergence of magic in 2012, but the actual divergence from our timeline already happens in 1990 when the game like a writ came out when it like started doing things different and was not able to always predict everything that was going to happen every year and really the main difference there is that the federal republic of germany has to deal with a lot more crises than it did and does in the real world you have the total ecological collapse of the north and baltic seas which are both of the seas that germany has in its north, uh, massive floodings as a result of that, huge amount of deaths. You got war in Eastern Europe, should be pretty relatable as to what the problems might be in that kind of situation. You have the meltdown of the Catanom nuclear plant in France, which of course, because it's built right on the border, devastated a significant portion of Germany also. You have a military push in the middle of all that. You have the, the Vitus Plague, killing five million people. And only now are we up to the point where magic re-enters the world. Yeah, that's fucking right. The, now it starts. And in Germany, of all places, inordinate amount of dragons that just spawn into the world, and one of them, a great dragon of just immense power, Feuerschwinge, it j just pops up and she just starts destroying everything. Just annihilating everything she could see for like no fucking reason. You have goblinization and all the problems that brought all over the world. You have Berlin falling into complete anarchy and the government having to move to Hanover instead. Which isn't as much of a cultural offense as you might think. The German capital city has been in different places over the centuries. You have uh, the collapse of the European Union, which of course Germany relies on economically a lot. And the other countries in the EU rely on Germany a lot. You have have the first Matrix crash, and then, and we're only up to 2031 here, the Euro Wars! Now, the Euro Wars are basically a decade of conflict that started with Russia invading Ukraine and then Poland. Which, you know. And then they started invading Germany, which wasn't too difficult because Germany was already fucking knackered from sending troops and materials and reinforcing their mates in Poland against the Russian invasion. They took about a third of the country in a pretty brutal war before getting stalled. There was a whole incident with still at this point unidentified fighter jets that bombarded key positions of both of the both sides of the front line and then there was a truce and of course all the war weary countries didn't want to fight war anymore and everything was fine. Psych, obviously, because shortly after that ended, a lot of radical Islamists funded by some state governments primarily Turkey, decided to go on like a wholly the inverse of a crusade and, you know, destroy 
the infidels in Europe, and they were pretty successful at it. They invited the Balkans, they invaded Greece, they invaded significant parts of Eastern Europe and the Iberian Peninsula. You even had them fighting in various parts of France and Italy. Germany wasn't directly affected by any of the fighting, but it was a war-ravaged nation now surrounded by war-ravaged nations, hoping to be able to recover a little bit from the war by having, you know, economically stable neighbors to the south, uh, among other places. But of course, instead of getting some breathing room, they had to redouble their war effort commitments and help defend their southerly neighbors. During Euro War II, and especially following Euro War II, several states actually seceded from the Federal Republic of Germany, and the Federal Republic of Germany was powerless to do anything about it, until finally in 2045 they decided to remake the German government and the German nation. And that is how we got the ADL. The Allianz Deutscher Länder, which means Alliance of German States, is the for real, actual, true legal successor, actually legally speaking, of the Federal Republic of Germany. I put a lot of emphasis on this because, by contrast, the Federal Republic of Germany was very explicitly not the legal successor state of the previous German nation-state. In the early 2040s, there was a very deliberate blue ribbon process of reorganizing Germany in accordance with how the actual politics of the country and the politics around the country had changed. They wrote a new constitution, changed internal borders, altered, dissolved, merged, and created institutions. The federal government became much more structured around direct democracy. So now, for instance, the president of Germany gets elected directly. And yes, Germany does in fact have a president currently in the real world right now. It's this guy. And the relationship of the president and the chancellor is a little bit like the relationship of the queen and the prime minister, where the chancellor is the head of government who has the, all the actual, like, executive power and is considered the most powerful person in the country, but the head of state is formally the president who fulfills a lot of ceremonial duties. A major aspect of German reorganization was to account for the fracturing that had occurred over the previous decade. Several states had seceded, and the ADL wanted them back. To that end, a lot of the actual institutional and political power was divested away from the federal government and given to the states. This is also the main reason why I can't just make a video about what Shadowrun Germany is like in its totality. Because there's like 15 of them, and like 4 extra bonus special zones that also need to be talked about in some capacity. And we are going to talk about all of those. But first, let's talk about the things that all Germans still do have in common. And that list starts with Urban Brawl. Germans love Urban Brawl. Every city has at least one Urban Brawl team, and it has long eclipsed football as the number one most popular sport, which is saying something given that Germany is one of the world's primary footy nations. If you don't know what Urban Brawl is, it's kind of like football, both real and American, in that you have a ball and two teams, and it is the objective of both of the teams to put the ball in the goal area of the other team. But you don't do this in an open field, no, no. You do this in usually some sort of damaged urban environment. And also you have guns. There's a lot of rules and regulations as to what kind of guns which type of player is allowed to have and how they're allowed to use those guns, but it is a very tactical and very violent sport. Usually the team with the better equipment wins. Uh, shooting down a camera is actually a worse offense than killing an opposing teammate, and straight up just liquidating the whole enemy team is an entirely valid tactic to win a game. And fractured though Germany may be, not only in this do they share a lot of cultural overlap, because 
all of the media is at the end of the day in the same language. So music, fashion trends, and the who is who of pop starlet drama, those all tend to be pretty homogenous the whole country over. Which is of course exactly how the media corporations want it because it's a lot cheaper to do this than have to develop like a cultural portfolio for several micro nations. The magical culture of Germany, like in most of Europe, is heavily dictated by witches and druids as opposed to the more tribal shamans that you would find in the United States for obvious reasons. Animal totems are still common, but they're not as universally prevalent as they are in the United States. And even hermetic wizards, which of course here are also the bigger of the two major magical groups, are much more influenced by naturalist miracle working than they are elsewhere. And speaking of miracle working, actually a lot of the witch covens and groups in Germany find themselves in a constant conflict with various Christian theurgical sects who think that their heathenism must be eradicated. We'll talk about that a little more later. Another thing that's consistent across all of Germany is inconsistent law enforcement. Even though it's one of the most corporate friendly nations in the sixth world, most of Germany has not really gone along with the whole putting the police in the hands of private contractors type thing. With a few notable exceptions, the monopoly on state violence is firmly in government hands. This isn't to say that the usual guy with gun contractors like Knight Errant or Centurion can't be found here in Germany, they are abundant, they just usually work security for private institutions. Curiously, this has led to a lot of them having a bit more of a hardened military bend, which of course you don't want to have when you're doing like actual police work, ideally, not that any of them give a shit. And Germany actually does have rather a lot of homegrown mercenary groups of international repute slash disrepute. Each state has its own police institutions and the systems that they run on are usually not very linked up with each other, not to mention that bureaucrats are often rather unwilling to cooperate across state lines. Though I wouldn't bang on any of that if I were you. This mule-headed reticence sometimes even extends to the federal police institutions such as the Bundesgrenzschutz, which in our continuity of time was eventually renamed Bundespolizei, but it hadn't been yet when the Shadowrun initially came out, so in the Shadowrun continuity it never was rebranded. Technically Bundesgrenzschutz means federal border guard, but they're not really just the Border Patrol, which is exactly why they were rebranded in our continuity. It, factually speaking, they're just the highest police institution in the country. Except in Hamburg, but we'll get to that too. In recent decades, the Bundesgrenzschutz has become increasingly militarized, making it much more akin to the gendarmeries of other European nations, which for a long time was rather a huge taboo in in German culture. I'll leave it up to you to consider why perhaps Germany is not too fond of the idea of militarized police forces. But the Bundesgrenzschutz enjoys a very high baseline popularity with the civilian population of the whole country because they deal with large-scale threats and there is no shortage of large-scale threats in the Sixth World. Most famously, in 2055, they coordinated and commanded Aktion Zebra, which was a collaboration between all of the other police institutions, both federal and state level, and then also local, and a bunch of private corporate contractors, bunch of militias that had formed, even Shadowrunner teams. And the goal was to eradicate as many insect spirits and their hives as possible. This was very successful, and even though of course Germany is not free of insect spirits, I mean they keep popping up everywhere, even well into the 2080s, the number that you will encounter is significantly lower than in the rest of the world. Bundesgrenzschutz is not, however, comparable to the FBI because they rarely conduct criminal investigations unless it's a very specific kind of crime that they investigate. 
investigate. The institution responsible for that would be the Bundeskriminalamt, the Federal Criminal Police Office, which consists largely of plainclothes officers, investigators, specifically detectives, working in close tandem with state prosecutors and international policing institutions such as Europol or others. But they only really get involved when you cross state lines. Each of the states also has their own Landeskriminalamt, which sometimes does and sometimes does not when they feel like they are out of their depth, call in the Bundeskriminalamt for help, and they can do that even when you haven't crossed state lines, so that's not a guarantee of protection. But the Bundeskriminalamt is unlike the FBI in its own different individual way also in that it does not function as a domestic intelligence agency. Extremist surveillance and terrorism prevention is the purview of the Bundesamt für Innere Sicherheit, or Federal Office for Internal Security, which was founded because the Bundesverfassungsschutz, the Federal Office Office for the Protection of the Constitution, which used to do what it now does, fucked up one too many times. There is a saying in Germany about law enforcement in general and the Verfassungsschutz in particular, which goes, Die sind auf dem rechten Auge blind. They are blind on their right eye, which refers to the fact that they seem to be rather a lot more eager to utilize their resources to protect the state from left-wing extremists than they do from right-wing extremists, if you catch my drift. If we're talking about non-police, there are of course the armed forces, the Bundeswehr, a significant portion of which is made up of Mobile Eingreiftruppe 2000, shortened to MET 2000 often, which is a private mercenary group that is beholden to always protect the German state. They do, however, operate all over the world as one of the most effective mercenary groups that might Money can buy. They even have a military intelligence wing that German institutions do like to make use of every once in a while when they want whatever the fuck it is they are doing to fly under the radar. Additionally, every state has its own military, which is usually a lot more like a formality. There are ceremonial forces, they don't really do much and they couldn't really do much, the Bundeswehr takes care of all the important external threats. The stated enemies of Germany's police institutions are first and foremost the Russian Vori and the Italian, or often Italian style but it's other ethnicities, Mafia, which together comprise the absolute lion's share of organized crime operations. The Mafia has a lot of families that are as fractured as the German states themselves really operating all over the place, and they probably do control a little more than the Vori. The Vori also has the slight problem that one of the primary fault lines of the Red Vori, which supports the current Russian government, and the White Vori, which opposes the current Russian government, just runs straight across the country. So a significant portion of their resources is dedicated to essentially a constant underground all-out or proxy war with just the brutal gang violence, assassinations, making an example of people. It claims a lot of victims, and many of them are innocent, so they are also much more heavily on the radar of police institutions. The major Asian syndicates do not have a strong foothold here in Germany. You can find the Yakuza, but they do mostly white-collar or white-collar associated crimes. And when they do get their hands dirty, it's usually it's, it's like a private, small, illegal black ops military force for the corporate sponsors that they are loyal to. The triads have been trying to elbow their way into the local sponsors smuggling business for decades. Interestingly, really the main syndicate from Asia you can find in pretty much every metroplex are Korean Seolpa rings, which really do operate in some niche so as to not piss off the major players, but also like make themselves essential to the local crime ecosystem everywhere. In the north and the west especially, the Dutch Penulsa can be found acting primarily as smugglers and fences. Also notably, Germany has a lot of piracy groups operating on the open sea, but also the vast and complex river systems and the lakes even. The most famous of which are the North German Likedele, which fashioned themselves after a historical, but not as much as we'd like to know about them is known about them and it's a lot of mythologization 
But that doesn't matter because they take that mythology of being like a Robin Hood style cooperative. But let's be serious. None of them syndicates can compete with the real big time criminals. The mega corporations. Especially for Shadowrunners, this level of the economic situation is absolutely crucial to understand. The ADL is the third largest economy in the world, and all of the big 10 AAA mega corporations have major holdings, assets, and operations in the country. Germany also has a lot of homegrown corporate players that do operate, of course, mainly in Germany, but also all over the world. So even if you're not playing in Germany and you'd like to see some interesting corporations that you could be introducing into to runs wherever you play your game that have a bit of a German flavor, this might be very useful to you as well. As an interesting aside, after decades of very, very like neoliberal corporate friendly politics, the recently elected, the new German government have taken rather a more aggressive stance, almost against the corporations, which has proven very popular with the voters. The new chancellor really likes to throw her weight around when it comes to reminding the corporations who is actually in charge of the country. Most notably, the concept of corporate extraterritoriality has been under assault in Germany for quite some time. It's been sort of a tradition, though never codified into law, because of course that would run against the very concept of extraterritoriality, that if you're a, even uncooperative corporate player and you have cops, German actual state cops knocking at your door at your extraterritorial facility, you let them in and allow them to investigate. And there are currently quite a few judicial and legal proceedings underway to ensure that the institution of extraterritoriality is completely dismantled in Germany. So let's take a look at who's gonna throw a lot of weight behind fighting against that. AG Chemie, as the name suggests, is a major chemical corporation composed of former giants like Bayer and BASF, currently headquartered in Ludwigshafen. Though it has fingers in many pies, most of its subsidiaries and the corporation itself as a core specialize in petrochemicals, plastics, high-end cyberware, medical supplies, and most crucially, food production. It is famously one of the most bellicose megacorporations probably in the world, taking a very literal interpretation of the term corporate warfare. They don't just hire Shadowrunner teams, they hire actual fucking mercenary armies. They were so extreme that their former CEO actually got arrested tried and put in prison for the murder of several executives of rival corporations. But their warfare experience does give them a bit of an advantage in the battlefield against eco-terrorists, of whom they are the primary target. They are probably the biggest contributors to chemical pollution, especially pollutants dumped in places where they really should not have been dumped in all of Europe. And there's a lot of groups who have a problem with this. The Deutsche Medien und Kommunikations AG is a massive media conglomerate created out of a lot of pretty much the entirety of failed news and print media after one of the major crashes of like the matrix and the economy. They got put together and turned into what we now call Demeco. Headquartered in Hamburg, they actually also do a lot of matrix technology and infrastructure and they are pretty cutting edge in the world market in terms of AI research, but the main workhorse is, and continues to be, media. And this is where they take rather an unusual approach. Because while yes, certainly they have no shortage of serious, serious type news feeds and programs, they kind of made a name for themselves with running a huge catalog of fringe media. Programming that caters to people living on the edge of society shows that frankly would be illegal to film and sometimes to broadcast in most of the ADL, except of course, the anarchist flux state of Berlin, which actually garnered them a lot of sympathy with the anarchists of that state. They also, very unusually for media corporations of the sixth world, do actual, for real, serious journalism sometimes. Like, they were the first 
in the world to break the story of the existence of cognitive fragmentation syndrome. And just in general, they have a tendency to take very progressive positions against established institutions. For instance, they support the rights of AI and technomancers pretty openly. All of this is, of course, perhaps quite rightly decried as cynical, trying to garner really positive PR, because at the end of the day, they are still a massive media corporation, most of which runs pro-status quo propaganda. And and that doesn't seem to be changing. When people talk about German corporations, they very often talk about the one that's owned by a dragon. But that kind of forgets the fact that the Frankfurter Bankenverein for a long time was also owned by a different dragon, the great dragon Nachtmeister, which actually created the legal precedent for supernatural creatures that are not human owning large corporations. Until, of course, Nachtmeister was killed by the other dragon. As the name suggests, it is a massive group of banks that work together and they absolutely dominate the financial market, not just in Germany, but like in the whole world. They own a piece of every single major bank on the planet. As such, they of course offer every kind of financial service imaginable and are very embedded in like financing, in investment, brokerage. Plus they're also titans in adjacent industries like real estate, insurance and legal services. Quite frankly, if it wasn't for the death of Nachtmeister and like a bunch of other things that were just bad luck for them, they might well have been able to become a triple-A megacorporation joining the ranks of the Big Ten. The internal structure and ownership arrangements of the Porteos AG is extremely clandestine, mysterious, a huge point for conspiracy theorists and people who are actually trying to find out what the fuck is going on alike. And all that is very much on purpose. Theories abound on what Proteus actually is, but it seems pretty clear that it is like the collaboration of various anonymous, massive global players in the corporate world, creating an entity that can conduct highly unethical research and facilitate highly illegal white collar crimes for them. They basically showed up in the 60s just out of nowhere, just popped up, said, hello, corporate court, give us double A status. No, you cannot audit us, but we do have some of the receipts. You cannot deny we deserve it. Now we get to have extraterritoriality, legally speaking. But they even went a step further, because instead of just having, like, their own legal country areas, the main expertise of the Proteus AG is to build arcologies. And I don't mean just arcologies anyway, I mean floating and underwater arcologies on the high seas. They are in fact the world leaders in constructing arcologies, even more than like Renraku. And you can find their arcologies on every continent. Or you know, in every ocean, all the sovereign waters of you know what I mean. And while many of them are legitimately used for agriculture, tourism, or just living space, the main reason that those exist is to also have the ones that exist solely to do unfathomably fucked research. This is cybernetics and biotech, this is computing, this is psychological, this is magical research. Classic Shadowrun scenario, if you're anywhere in like Northern Europe on the coast of the North or Baltic Seas, is just somebody showing up like a Johnson and going, look, I know that there's a abandoned Proteus Arcology and it's full of very expensive and valuable stuff. You want to come plunder it with me? Do yourself a favor and don't go. It's not that the Johnson is lying. All that shit is definitely there and it's probably enough money to retire on. But also whatever reason that they abandoned that arcology is likely still there as well. Zeta Krupp, of course, the mega corporation owned by a dragon, headquartered in Essen. For a long time, the biggest mega corporation 
in the world, sometimes even, you know, there's a bit of a race between various contenders going on right now, and it emerged out of a series of vicious takeovers by the BMW Motor Company. And yes, they are owned by the great dragon Lofia, but look, I talk about uh, SK a lot in my Big Ten video, a lot more in depth, so if you want to learn more about them, I recommend watching that one. And last but not least, this one may seem like a small one, but it is an emerging titan, the Tricon Holding AG, which should is only a three-way between the German dock wagon equivalent a Bunoma, the Met 2K mercenary group, and Ruhmetal AG, which produces weapons. But their real power lies in, and some of you may have already guessed this, their close ties to the German government. In fact, 12.5% of Tricon is actually owned by the German federal government directly. They are a pretty new corporation, only founded in 2080, and their main purpose is to coordinate efforts between all of the corporations operations that it owns. It's a bit of a sleight of hand monopoly, if you will. It also is a significant part of like the corporate diplomacy wing of the German government, which given the recent tensions between the German government and the corporations, can get kind of awkward a little bit. And speaking of sleight of hand, uh, through a lot of that, like asset share bundling and like some arcane financial tricks, the Frankfurter Bankenverein actually is the biggest shareholder in Tricon. Which, you know, it does create the even more awkward situation that the corporate diplomacy wing of the German government is quite literally owned by one of its biggest corporations. Luckily, there is also the Deutsche Treuhand, which does the same thing in a much more official capacity. But of course, the Frankfurter Bankverein also has a controlling share there. Now, we've talked a lot about German companies that also have a lot of influence abroad, but that also works the other way around. As I said before, all of the Big Ten can be found in a major way here in Germany. Germany, but Renraku Computer Systems really does deserve a separate mention because it stands out. Like Zitacorp, uh, it's much better explained in my Big Ten video, but of all the Japanese mega corporations, Renraku is the most successful in Europe precisely because they entered the German market early, they invested a lot, and they continue to be vicious about defending it. If you know some things about Shadowrun, you will actually know that a lot of Renraku product lines don't have Japanese. Japanese, but German names like their Kraftwerk Cyberdeck series. That should give you an idea of how important Germany is as a market to Renraku. And of course, there is one non triple A mega corporation that, when it comes to Germany, might as well be one, but it's from a foreign country, and that would be Maersk Incorporated Assets. One of the oldest mega corporations in the world, absolute heavyweight when it comes to global shipping on air, land, and sea, very diversified miscellaneous holdings. They have mines, oil platforms, refineries, investment banks, hospitals. They're the only meaningful competition Wuxing has in the global shipping market. And if you are interested in maybe perhaps somewhat piratey logistics runs, Germany and the Netherlands are the two main battleground states for these corporations. They have this, shall we call it, interesting habit of being racist while not being racist. Like, they're not culturally racist, they just put you exactly where you make them the most amount of money. So you'll have a lot of trolls working in packaging, but if you can prove that if you that you make more money to them in literally any area, they will immediately transfer you there. They do not care. And now that we have all the corporations out of the way, let's talk about the individual regions of the ADL. What sets them apart? what you can do in them, and which ones are really a little bit too boring. And they're all sorted alphabetically, but it's the actual name of the place that is the thing that sets the alphabetical order, not like any titles or prefixes or suffixes. You'll get it in a minute. The state of Badisch Pfalz, located on the southwestern border Germany shares with France, for the most part, is not what you might call a happy marriage. Instead, it's two areas nobody wanted mushed together because they happened to be adjacent, and that made it a lot simpler for the federal government. And so naturally, the two parts of the state fucking hate each other. Like, a lot. It consists of the more northerly Palatinate region, in German known as Pfalz, 
which used to be part of the state of Rheinland-Pfalz, but which saw a lot of abandonment after dwarves and Luxembourgish refugees sort of reshuffled that whole entire state, and the southerly Baden region, formerly part of the state of Baden-Württemberg, never really too economically productive, and in this case also horribly ravaged by civil war. It was a hotbed of guerrilla warfare by the orc troll resistance against the racist policies and mobs and, let's be honest, kind of genocide that was happening in the southern states. So Württemberg just kind of dropped Baden. They were like, yeah, fuck off, we don't need you, we don't want you, when they reorganized. Over the decades, Badish Pfalz has been particularly knackered by a bunch of natural disasters disasters, ranging from earthquakes of both the mundane and supernatural astral variety, to storm floods, to tornadoes. And of course you have the whole Katanom SOX thing, which means that the really largest border, I think, I don't have the map in at the top of my head now, I should have looked this up when I was scripting this video, they share with like a radioactive wasteland. And in the new, more federalized model of the ADL, the responsibility for the economic recovery coming out of all those crises was squarely placed on the shoulder of the state government, which was of course a bit of a problem given that the state government had no fucking money. So you have inter-metahuman racial tensions, you have the north and the south hating each other, you have administrative chaos and disarray, you have devastation, you have rampant poverty. Those are the perfect conditions for the emergence of what we in the business call the fascism. And that's exactly what happened. Badish Pfalz is home to a bunch of far-right militant organization who, on one hand, hate the people in the other half of the state, and on the other hand, hate metahumans. But the only one really worth mentioning is the Gross Badische Kreuzzugsbewegung, the Great Badish Crusade Movement, led by one Dr. Hedwig Gabler. Basically, she did a bunch of revisionist history and came up with this concept of a reunified Great Baden, and that was the goal, which in her mind, a lot of the other states during the reshuffling of the ADL had kinda done, just with like the political legitimacy of creating a new Germany. So she felt it was unfair that Baden hadn't gotten its opportunity. Especially when she was elected mayor of Karlsruhe, she became real, real with her plans. She started hiring mercenaries and training the, I, and I swear to God, this is the real name of this, the Gobbler Youth. Because of course, to make her dreams a reality, she would need to take some bites out of all of the surrounding states, including the Troll Kingdom and France. Radioactively contaminated wasteland, though, that kind of didn't- that kind of didn't seem too relevant, didn't really factor into her plans, wasn't really part of the- Somehow the border there really ran along the big fucking cement wall. And of course I know what all of you have been thinking. Huh, yeah! I thought Karlsruhe was also part of the Badish Pfalz region, but the info slide earlier said that Pirmasens is the capital of the place, which is of course very odd, even though it isn't, as the name suggests, the final resting place of Charlemagne, Karlsruhe is nonetheless an extremely historically important city in Germany, and it's also not really one of the smaller ones, not to mention it's the home of the Bundesverfassungsgericht, the constitutional court, the highest court in the whole country. Yeah, well, it used to be the capital. It was at one point. But Dr. Hedwig Gambler became very adept at sort of turning the place into her own personal fiefdom. And the security apparatus, even the parts of it that, you know, weren't compromised, found themselves a little bit unable to do anything about that. And also the judges of said constitutional court, which was of course still located there, were beginning to grow sort of a little bit nervous about their host. They they were like, the, what, this is... I'm seeing some historical parallels, and I don't like them. So the Bundeswehr moved in, arrested Gabler, and declared the city into a special administrative zone under direct military jurisdiction. So it isn't actually, technically speaking, part of Badisch Pfalz anymore, and they had to choose a new place to be their capital. And they chose Pirmasens, because there's... 
Not that many other big towns in that area. Life in Badish Pfalz is not really focused on the cities all that much. It's very rural, very hilly, and very fucking poor, as I have mentioned several times before. I just cannot overemphasize how poor this place is. No matter where you live, Whenever you leave the house, there is a significant risk of running into armed political extremists. Whether that be far-right militias who want to see what kind of- what kind of your heritage is, and whether you have any relatives of the bad region, or even the occasional far-left meta-human self-defense force with a bit of a shoot-first and ask-questions-later type attitude, not to mention the- the hidden little ravines that you will just not see because they popped up because of some recent earthquake, and they contain all manner of weird, completely unknown paracritters that have, like, materialized somewhere in the depths of the earth. You'll be lucky if the thing you run into is a fucking basilisk. The primary industry of Badish Pfalz is agriculture, primarily fruits and vegetables, but also dairy products for those who can afford them. Oh, and of course, the Pfalz Palatinate region is known and distinguished among connoisseurs around the world as a wine-growing region. The Freistaat Bayern, or in English, Free State of Bavaria, is one that already existed in the Federal Republic of Germany, just not you know, quite the same. It also already had a bit of an outsized impact on the politics of the federal nation state. A little bit, little bit more power than maybe they should have. In the ADL, though, it is shrunk down significantly in both of those terms, which is all the well for the Bavarian nationalists that have been calling for this kind of thing to happen for a long time, because now it's only the real Bavaria. If you don't know, Bavaria is basically the Texas of Germany. Weissbier, Lederhosen, Dirndl, Weisswurst, this type white sausage, all of the music, all the things that you associate as being stereotypically German, including Oktoberfest, are actually stereotypically Bavarian. The rest of Germany isn't really into all of that stuff. And we kind of make fun of it. In many ways, Bavaria is a lot like Badisch Pfalz, with the main difference being that it doesn't fucking suck to live there. Yeah, there's a lot of sort of rural wilderness type area. It's not always easy to navigate, but it's not fundamentally polluted or ravaged by catastrophe or infested with unfathomably dangerous critters. Munich is the central metroplex and acts as the economic powerhouse of the region. And it's generally pretty safe to be anywhere in Bavaria. It's not, I mean, you know, not as dangerous as many places in the Sixth World are. Even if you're metahuman, it generally speaking, so long as you're a Bavarian metahuman, you'll be fine. If you're a non-Bavarian metahuman though, this place can, can get pretty fucking racist very, very quickly. It's a wealthy state, also rich in culture, not just the traditional type of culture, but modern clubs, music, arts, poetry, literature. The sprawl of Munich is interesting because it, the borders are particularly fractal. Because of the way that the geography of the region works, it may extend into one valley that's like highly urbanized and even pretty densely populated, but then just across the hills in the next valley, which of course you can't easily look into or see, it's just abandoned former towns, rural villages, wildlands. This kind of fragmentation allows for some pretty easy cohabitation because you don't have to necessarily see or even know who your neighbors are. As such, even though it is generally quite conservative, Bavaria is home to a lot of fringe political communities from all parts of the political spectrum. Often flying completely under under the radar and it taking several years before anyone finds out that they've been hiding out in some place with an official census population of zero. Cults are pretty big on building their compounds here. They exist in, in a sort of splendid isolation, but also because of the large number of electric martins in the state, many techno Luddites have found a home here as well. And uh, uh, people say, this may or may not be true, but people do say that those techno Luddites really like helping the electric martins along in spreading and increasing their numbers. Bavaria is also famous for its go gangs. There's a lot of roads, a lot of hidden places, and law enforcement can be spotty. So if they're a bit clever about it, they can just ride around the countryside and do go gang things 
with impunity, essentially. This puts them in a great underworld position in that they are basically the thing that connects the major urban metropolis of Munich with all the surrounding hidden and mysterious valleys. They get paid a lot to run reconnaissance, raids, and protection. If you're a Shadowrunner in Bavaria, you need some Gurgangs in your roller decks. They can get you in, out and hidden away like no one else. Not to mention, they probably know more about those hardcore, excess, really fucked up elite parties that happen in the villas out in the countryside than probably even the security staff of those very villas. Munich, of course, being the beating economic heart of the area, is very diversified in its industry, whereas the countryside, and this is true, is very focused on making beer, which checks out, honestly. It really, if the amount of beer consumption in Bavaria and the amount of beer that Bavaria exports to, yeah, that really checks out. Especially Renraku has rather a hold over the city. They've built an arcology there, which is not actually as common as some people believe, and they control like half the local economy through subsidiaries. This includes the Black Sheriffs, who very deliberately have a similar aesthetic and coding as Lone Star, but have literally nothing to do with Lone Star. Among Shadowrunners, Munich kinda has a reputation for, if if you're doing a run for Renraku, the easiest exit strategy out of most situations is to just get arrested. If you're caught with your back to the wall in some deep, dark underground facility, just call the cops. They'll send in a strike team, put you in cuffs for trespassing, and then the next day you will be free to walk with the cost of your extraction deducted from your pay. But of course the inverse is also true, right? So if you're doing a run against Renraku or one of its many, many subsidiary holdings in this city, do not expect the Black Sheriffs to even know what non-lethal means. Ah, Berlin. Biggest city in Germany, often its capital, often devolved into various states of anarchy, and often sort of split down the middle. Now a combination of all three. Well, it's, it's not quite the capital at all right now, currently. But a lot of powerful megacorporations have taken up residence in the West these days, and a lot of important institutions have taken up demonstrative residence here to send like a political sign to a political symbol. And Berlin is nothing if not a city where there's a lot of political symbols. So in like an out of game type context, right, Seattle is the main city of Shadowrun. Shadowrun has a whole world, but most of the lore that was written, most of the adventures that were published, revolve around Seattle. And then there's another tier of several cities around the world that also have a disproportionate amount of lore and material written about them, and seem like, from an out-of-game perspective, more important than the others. Berlin is one of those cities. It's one of the most well-explored parts of the setting, though video game Shadowrun on Dragonfall is set in Berlin. The main thing that sets the city apart in the Sixth World is that for the longest time it was a functioning anarcho state. After years of escalating tensions, the security apparatus finally lost control. A bunch of people stormed City Hall and passed a law that said Berlin is now an anarcho state, and if anyone accumulates too much power in this anarcho state, any person is allowed to kill them. And then they blew up City Hall. This was the birth of the Flux State, or Status F, which is defined to be in opposition of status quo, maintaining stability not through calcification, but through a constant back and forth of various different emergent power structures that form and break and reform alliances to keep each other in check and prevent each other from becoming too powerful. And this kinda worked pretty well, actually. These people weren't stupid, they were anarchists. They'd all been to college. They all understood that society was going to continue to exist, and that the continued success 
of Berlin, the, the standard of living, the people actually being able to have a happy life here would depend on working together. That really wasn't the point of contention. They just didn't want too much power to be concentrated in too much of a monopoly. So even when it came to things like public infrastructure that was shared by all, they distributed responsibilities. Some things, like public transport, continued to work pretty well. Other things, like healthcare, not so much. It really depended on the people involved. During this time, political extremists of every variety were drawn to Berlin like moths to light. Now, if you've ever talked to any kind of political extremist, you will know that they barely agree with themselves on anything. Which was great for the flux state because the constant conflict, the back and forth, the difference of opinion was not exactly how it maintained order, but certainly how it staved off chaos. So you have hundreds if not thousands of vastly disparate political and pragmatic groups. Mostly various kinds of socialists and neo-anarchists, but also gangs, religious congregations, gated communities, even corporations were part of the Berlin Flux state, making and breaking alliances. The basic unit of social organization became the Keats which is a somewhat proletarian German term that is not just denoting a certain neighborhood, but also the community of that neighborhood. A Keats often shares certain ideals and has agreed upon rules. Because it's not just because there's anarchism doesn't mean there's no rules. The rules just depend on the particular area that you're in. And while there was no centralized legal corpus, if you came to Berlin expecting to get away with doing something just utterly morally reprehensible, like, oh, I don't know, run a pedo brothel, you should expect people with guns to show up eventually and give you what you deserve. There were vigilante groups aplenty and self-appointed, though often really generally respected, judges. Though of course a lot of those groups were also just mercenaries working for the highest bidder or someone they had a particular loyalty to, or dispensing justice in line with their very particular interpretation of their very particular ideology. Groups like the Schockwellenreiter, a hacktivist collective, who is known for wanting all information to be free, which actually emerged from the for real actual existing in our world Chaos Computer Club, which is a, a, a hacker guild, if you will, that exists here in Germany, but has members all over the world, and which sometimes actually advises the boomers in the German government when they have like a technology question, only for them to, you know, just do whatever it is they think is right anyway, even though they have no fucking idea, as boobers are wont to do, they had their formative years in the Berlin Flux state. But all good things must come to an end. In 2055, after years of incredibly expensive intelligence and infiltration work, an alliance of megacorporations as unlikely as the bedfellows that the Flux state itself regularly created moved in with full military power to take control of and pacify the Berlin Flux state with the tacit approval of the federal government. And even with their nigh infinite funds and high-tech state-of-the-art equipment, super mega elite soldier trained guys, they only managed to take half the city back because they really were very sure of themselves. The western half of the city is now in recovery and learning to become a real normal city again. But the culture, the traditions, the way of life of the Flux State is so deeply ingrained in the people who live there, it's gonna be pretty difficult to get it out of them. And East Berlin is now basically a microcosm of the Flux State. All the hardliners fled there, it was a huge tumult and then the corporations built a wall around the, the eastern part of the city. Which of course is something Berlin has a lot of experience with. That wall might as well be built out of fucking Swiss cheese. I guess it's the thought that counts. And you know, aside from literally all of that, Berlin is, is like any other metroplex in the sixth world.
Surrounding the often quite prosperous free city of Berlin is the really kinda always quite impoverished state of Brandenburg. Remember how Munich works as a kind of economic motor of Bavaria? Well, partly because it's a separate legal entity, Berlin is more of a black hole for wealth for Brandenburg. When investments do flow, they flow into Berlin. And when investments don't flow, nobody wants to invest in Brandenburg either because it's adjacent to Berlin. They even lost their historical capital, Potsdam, to the ever-expanding Berlin Plex. Poverty is really the defining characteristic of Brandenburg, and it has been for a long time. Being part of the socialist GDR was not great for the economy of Brandenburg, and even back then, most of the actual economic focus was placed on Berlin. A lot of the area is wet and swampy in an unusable way, the other lot of the area is dry and sandy in terms of soil, it doesn't hold too much water. And then you have a lot of like dry pine forests that burn very easily. Both of these things, by the way, if you don't follow the German news, are problems that Brandenburg this very summer in our world has had to deal with. Which just goes to show you how well researched these books are. Oh, and the boars. There are so many fucking balls. And a lot of the especially leaders are these like awakened paracritters that are the size of like a baby hippo and have Wolverine regeneration powers. Brandenburg took the brunt of the Russian military invasion during the first Euro war and then saw no economic recovery in the second Euro war. And whenever money does flow into Brandenburg, a lot of it is like siphoned off into dozens of little rivulets by a whole filtration system of corruption. Top level politicians to low level bureaucrats, everybody wants their cut. It's not bad for everyone though. Brandenburg is a veritable smuggler's paradise. You have excellent access to the wide open corridors of Eastern Europe. Law enforcement is really more of a suggestion even when it shows up at all. Not to mention the place is huge. There's so many spots where you can like just hide out and lay low. And by lay low, I mean lay low in style. Brandenburg has been an area of like constructed military importance going back through like the first Kaiserreich, well, which is kind of the second Kaiserreich. You have the, it's close to the capital, you have all the troop movements of the GDR, you have the Euro Wars happening that needed the area to be fortified. When the corporations prepared to invade Berlin, all of that stuff left its mark on the land. Brandenburg is speckled with anonymous, abandoned military installations hidden away in the forest. So if you ever want any big weapons, and yes, I am talking about tanks and planes here, this is where you want to go. Another interesting fact about Hamburg is that it is home to one of Germany's famous ethnic minorities, the Sorbs. The Sorbs are a Slavic people group with their own language and culture that has lived in Germany for several centuries at this point. Primarily in Brandenburg and Saxony, though Saxony is often a lot less accommodating. They have really cool traditional style dress, a particular st type of architecture, and they make these gorgeous easter eggs. I mean, just look at them. And the sad thing is, a lot of Germans don't even know they've lived around these parts basically forever. Traditionally speaking, they tend to be rural, waterbound people. And especially in the Sixth World, many of them have returned to their cultural roots of being tenders of canals and wetlands. Meaning they have a lot of pretty powerful shamans and druids there to protect their pristine, unpolluted lands. In recent years, this has led to a lot of conflict, specifically with Atz technology in the Spree Forest. Aztec decided that actually it was time to gentrify all of that unofficial nature reserve and turn it into like a major tourist destination. And for that, of course, all of the nature would have to be torn down and rebuilt in a way that was similar to what was originally there, but more in line with what the marketing people had in mind. And the Sorbs were like... Absolutely the fuck not. And then they did so much guerrilla warfare that they really made Ads Technology question whether it was just sunk cost fallacy to still hold on to the investment that they had tried to make. And really, this is a... I love this so much. By which I mean I hate it. 
The, a lot of the money that they the Sorbs use to like finance their operations is by basically stealing Ads Technology military equipment, specifically their tanks, to then sell them to the smugglers in Brandenburg. Of all the settings I would like to see reflected in the real world, Shadowrun is not the one. Moving on to a very different, i.e. wealthy part of Germany, Franconia, or Franken, as the Germans like to say, used to be the northern part of Bavaria, a compact about which they were not always particularly happy. This place is so crazy and unusual, it has, and you better be sitting down for this, a sizable, non-shrinking middle class. A lot of high-tech industry can be found here, and most of it is this thing that German industry is famous for, which is like a small corporation producing some incredibly specific piece of equipment to a just unfathomable level of quality. Networks of this kind have always been rather strong in Franconia, and because of this, and also because of the unusual phenomenon of smart people-oriented policy making, big corporate global players have found it a lot easier to integrate themselves into this ecosystem instead of just taking it over. There's a, a complex system of, you might almost say vassalization, though that sounds a lot more extreme than what it actually is, divvying up these middle class businesses. So instead of just buying the businesses themselves and completely swallowing them up, they buy exclusive distribution rights or, you know, certain packs patent usage license agreements. And to do this, they need to sweeten a lot of deals, which is reflected in the waistlines of middle-class bank accounts. Both the owners and the highly skilled employees of these small companies benefit. Not unlike the flux state, the competing interests here create a sort of equilibrium, which is often rather intransparent because you never know who is in bed with whom right now, which can make shadow runs very, uh, you know, eventful. And while you're not going to be raiding any major, huge, heavily fortified corporate compound, the big players do provide a lot of very subtle ways of protection to the small businesses that they are aligned with. Not to mention the businesses themselves like to get rather creative in how they secure their facilities. A lot of this high-end industry is magic so expect some nasty surprises. They're also very difficult to penetrate because just from a structural standpoint, these businesses could operate very effectively with only one or two people knowing the majority of the information that, if revealed, could constitute security leaks. Whereas the big companies, of course, need to have that distributed way more widely, which creates more failure points. Fewer failure points means fewer opportunities that Shadowrunners can exploit. Aside from that, Franconia is big on tourism. They have a lot of historically relevant sites, uh, a lot of very expensive resorts, and just the region is fucking gorgeous. I mean, look at this. They know they are in like a fantasy land, the likes of which you only see on Tridio. There's a lot of historically accurate and not so accurate sites speckled everywhere to make weary travelers feel like they are in fact in a fairy tale adventure game. A major aspect of all this are the centaurs that live in the area, there's quite a few of them, which are recognized as actual citizens, not just tourist attractions. Franconia is generally pretty progressive on like metahuman, metasapient and all that kind of stuff. Uh, rights, integrations, help, anti-discrimination, which really cannot be said about most of its neighbors. That may be why uh, there's so many metahumans living in Franconia. The land is also pretty saturated with magic. There's plenty of telesmic sites and a lot of supernatural critters that cannot be found elsewhere. Like for instance, the Nachtgiger, which is a sort of predatory stealth cockatrice that a lot of people actually think is a myth. It's not even widely recognized by the scientific community. Until you're out late one night drunk, and it swoops you up into the sky. In all fairness though, Franconia is the playground of a very small number of highly skilled Shadowrunners that need certain connections to get in here. It's not a hot spot for the profession. It is, however, a nice place to visit and a pretty great place to retire. A lot of these business know and understand that they could use the expertise of a retired Shadowrunner to improve their products or to keep their facilities safe 
from other Shadowrunners. You'd enjoy a level of insulation from big corporate players that you may have pissed off in the past, and they really will not look too closely at what's going on, because they understand their side of the arrangement. So if you want to pull a Mike Amontrout, because you don't want to be the guy who sits in the ticketing booth saying beep every time somebody swipes their ticket at the parking lot, Franconia is a good place to do that. The second major German metroplex we're going to talk about today could not be more different from Berlin. Groß Frankfurt is kind of like one of those classic German city-states, but it's way bigger, it's way more sprawling, and it has way more rural areas. Groß Frankfurt is probably the most economically powerful state in all of Germany, and that isn't just because of its vast array of goods producing industry, which it has, but that's really more of an afterthought. Now, Frankfurt is the financial keystone of Europe. It is thoroughly owned and operated by banks. It formed when various different, already quite connected cities from three different states decided fully completely of their own volition, of course, to fuse together to create a singular entity. And this metropolis is governed by a series of pretty independently operating ministries, which are divided 50-50 among corporations and elected officials of the general public. Now, this is mostly German corporations, but also some global players like Ares. Now, the electorate does technically get to decide which of the corporations get which of the ministries, but the politicians elected to transform the will of the people into the actual corporate assignments to the ministries, they all either used to work for the corporations or they expect to be working the corporations after they retire from politics. So you have the biggest bank, the Frankfurter Bankenverein, responsible for regulating the financial sector, you have the biggest polluter, AG Chemie, responsible for regulating the environment ministry, and you have the cops, Sternschutz, responsible for overseeing the police. And Frankfurt is actually one of those cities, actually pretty much the only complete state in Germany that has a private police contract. And something, once again, a lot of people are confused by Sternschutz, just like the black sheriffs, it's reminiscent of Lone Star. It has nothing to do with Lone Star. They are a 100% German corporation, 100% prone to brutal and violent excesses. The most accurate abbreviation for Sternschutz in every sense imaginable is SS. They tacitly support right-wing groups so long as they don't cut into corporate profits, and they will crack down super hard on left-wing groups especially the ones who cut into corporate profits. If you were gonna try to be a lot fairer than you should be, the corporations have been pretty good to Frankfurt. There is comparatively little poverty, a lot of funding for public projects, so long as they can, like, slap their PR logos on it, and also no shortage of jobs. Of course, the only really well-paid ones require rather a bit of higher education, and Frankfurt is big enough to hide a lot of poverty, and they're pretty good at it. Because they get to set policy and because of their additional stranglehold on the local real estate market, the big corporate players have been able to sort of gentrify or, you know, de-gentrify, I suppose, it's a two-way process, <clears throat> out of the way ghettos for poor people to live that are still close enough to, like, the major economic center for them to show up and do their horribly underpaid work and disappear again. But if you drive through the city, unless you really, really go off the path in ways that you probably will not even be able to unless you know exactly what you're doing, you will not see these poverty-stricken areas. As you can probably imagine, Frankfurt is a shadowrunning hotspot, and there is a place for every kind of shadowrunner here. But if you want to make the big bucks in Frankfurt, you need to be built different. Introducing the Frankfurt School. So look, Shadowrun, like any cyberpunk game, has a black trench coat to pink mohawk spectrum. This is mostly an out-of-game term, uh, but basically it sets a lot of the tone for games and campaigns. Black trench coat is more like the super professional 
traditional mega stealthy, you go in, you go out, nobody sees you type of operation. Pink Mohawk is go in guns blazing, do the work being cool guns blazing, get out guns blazing, ideally while wearing some sort of utterly impractical, colorful outfit. The Frankfurt School is as black trench coat as it gets. Frankfurt as a city does not like violence. They like to have their stuff compartmentalized and squared away. Even the criminal syndicates here prefer litigation over assassination. The shadows are no different. A lot of Johnsons, or Schmitz as they're called in Germany, in Frankfurt expect a degree of subtlety and professionalism that even a break-in is considered a little bit garish to get the job done. Frankfurt school runners are faces grifters, illusionists, social adepts, lawyers, fixers, brokers, burglars, and ghost hackers that no one ever sees the involvement of. And they engage in complex social manipulation, legal shenanigans, gaslighting trickery, all manner of extremely advanced stuff to get the job done. If you even bring a gun to a run like this, it's considered a major faux pas. These are some of the best shadow runners in the whole world, but their job is extremely high stakes and very dangerous. Even outside of Germany, a lot of shadow runners who aren't just street chumps with a gun and like to call themselves shadow runners understand and have heard of the Frankfurt School. Even if a runner isn't from Frankfurt, if they identify with the Frankfurt School, it's they have a good idea of what caliber and what kind of approach of person they are dealing with. And we have another Metroplex for you, this one even more different still. The tradition-steeped maritime metropolis of Hamburg, also known as the Venice of the North because it has a lot of canals, a lot of bridges, and it really fucking stinks in a lot of places. The city sits at the mouth of the Elbe River, an essential shipping waterway to the North Sea, both of which are deeply contaminated and polluted bodies of water, and both of which have done quite a bit of reorganizing, shall we say, of the city and how it is uh, shaped. Long before the Sixth World even, Hamburg has been known as a safe haven for social outcasts and people fleeing all kinds of persecution. Back in medieval times, it was a major turnstile of trade in the Hanseatic League, so the citizens of Hamburg have always been very cosmopolitan, very tolerant of other cultures, other peoples, very interested in them too. It features the Ripperbahn, one of the oldest continuously operated red light districts in the world. It is in fact so important to the local economy that it has its own police station, the Davidwache, which covers less than one square kilometer, making it the smallest police precinct in the world. Hamburg is and always has has been very proud of its diversity, and that is reflected in its politics. In 2070, when the federal government passed a number of draconian anti-technomancer laws that would lead to their capture and, uh, let's be serious, dissection by massive corporations, Hamburg basically went yeah, that's not happening. Uh, actually, Hamburg is a safe haven for technomancers. And then they kicked out the Bundesgrenzschutz. Whether they were allowed to do that is a bit of a legally contentious issue, but given that the witch huntiness of the whole situation has subsided a little bit, and even the federal government has realized that maybe those draconian anti-technomancer laws were kind of, you know, draconian. It does appear as though the preferable option right now is to let the matter rest and not talk about it. Hamburg has a fully privatized police force called Hansek, which is owned primarily by the Hamburg government and also several other Hamburg-based corporations and is supposed to have a bit of an inherently Hamburg identity. And they have their hands full because Hamburg is a bit of a crime hotspot. You have to consider uh, many parts of the city are ruined, abandoned, flooded, inherently labyrinthine. A lot of stuff that's illegal elsewhere is allowed here, which should intuitively kind of reduce the workload of the police, but it is also done in such a way where the line is very blurry between, like, completely legal entertainment and criminal activity. And of course, the type of organization that has the great 
greatest business expertise in running brothels, prostitution rings of all kinds, gambling operations, making and distributing drugs are crime syndicates. Poverty is rampant, so there's no shortage of bodies. And tourism is huge. There is a constant stream of just people coming in from all over the world, many of them there specifically for the CD entertainment. Of course, they will all claim they're here for the music festivals, of which Hamburg does have quite a few. It is one of the music capitals of the world, really. Believe it or not, the Beatles were discovered here. Primary number one crime that happens in Hamburg, though, is smuggling and also piracy, but the two are sort of inextricably linked. And a lot of it does tend to happen, you know, the piracy bit outside of town. Though you'd be surprised how often you might be going through a canal on your little barge and then somebody shows up and is like, give me all your money. Doesn't matter that it's happening in the middle of town, it's still piracy. Especially the liquor dealer, a sort of pirate co-op, bring all manner of contraband into Europe through Hamburg. Despite the enormous amount of pollution that the city suffers under, the North Sea, for instance, is really essentially uninhabitable for pretty much all life. Or perhaps especially because of it, Hamburg is home to a number of pretty fucking radical environmentalist groups. The Sachsenwald Nature Reserve, which is not really officially a nature reserve, it's a nature reserve because there's a bunch of powerful druids there, and they have a magical circle, and it's a very powerful, respected magical circle, and very powerful, respected magical environmentalist group are just one example. And in true Hamburg fashion, they also include a bunch of hermetics, adepts, shamans, and curiously, voodoo practitioners of which there are quite a few in Hamburg. If you want to be a shadow runner in Hamburg, you best not be afraid to get wet in some really, really cold and dirty water, because the city is notoriously difficult to navigate by car. You need some sort of water vehicle, there is really no way around it, and it preferably should be something that can make the narrow twists and bends of the canal, while also if you go out on, say, the river to cross from one part of the city to the other, doesn't get spontaneously misappropriated as a submersible or maybe an aircraft by a mile storm. And just to be clear about this, mild storm in Hamburg does not mean the same thing it means in the rest of the world. And don't forget the huge amount of, like, toxic spirits and paracritters that you will find in every pond. Giant Jauchekäfer beetles, shambling animated corpses, and, like, stealthy night mantas soaring through the night sky unseen. But somehow, most of the people who live here absolutely love it. And I guarantee you it'll take only one visit for you to understand why. Though quite rural and perhaps at first glance not filled with a bunch of exciting content, Hessen-Nassau has some unexpected depth to it. It's one of those patchwork states that was sort of created in the term of like a lot of reshuffling that was happening when the Republic was remade. Barring parts of Lower Saxony, two bits of North Rhine-Westphalia, a little slice of the old uh, Rhineland Palatinate, and uh, very crucially, losing Frankfurt. Economically, it both benefits and suffers from being squanched in the middle of having, like, to the south, the major banking capital, financial, important city of Frankfurt Megaplex. You have to the north, you have the capital Megaplex of Hanover. And to the west is the very densely populated, highly industrially productive Rhein-Ruhr Megaplex. So you might say that their logistics sector is doing well. But the locals will take this to mean the human trafficking done by the Greek Mafia, which is what that is a euphemism for, so don't say that. Seriously, they used to be so powerful that, like, the city of Kassel, the old capital, had to stop being the capital because literally every single politician of every party in every position 
was in their pocket. Just the name Castle became so tainted, not just in the state, but like known throughout the ADL that they had to change the capital to Gießen to like avoid being called a narco state, basically. Or rather a human trafficking state, which is worse. In practice, being sandwiched between three major economic powerhouses kind of means that Hessen-Nassau is being drained of its economic, especially in investment potential, you know, kind of like Brandenburg is with Berlin, except, you know, three ways. The one thing the state can boast, though not all agree on whether this is a boon or a bane, is that it is a very important region for the study of hermetic magic. Some pretty specific schools of hermetic magic, but important. Several world-renowned faculties of hermetic magical research can be found at various universities in the state, and they do all have a sort of dry bend, if you want to put it like that, a little bit, a little bit sterile. The most prominent is called renewed hermeticism, although in some places it's called German hermeticism, and it is a very scientific minded approach to like dispense with all the spiritual aspects of magic and take a fundamentally, almost fundamental list scientific approach to the study and development of magical theory. It's magic, but without all the point he had, woo-woo. The only use they have for dusty old grimoires full of mysticism and arcane secrets is to rip them apart and meticulously test all of the possible hypotheses that they can pull out of them in a dry, lab coat, scientific setting. Their contributions to the hermetic tradition cannot be understated. These are some very significant researchers, but even the crustiest wizard will admit that they lack a certain amount of flair. It is, after all, cool to have a pointy hat. It's also ironic that because they're in Germany, they these like very dry type non-spiritualism wizards are working in very old style buildings that have like an inherent mysticism to them. There are some other similar and some a little bit dissimilar hermetic traditions to be found among the universities of Hessen-Nassau. And though there is a lot of rivalry, it's very friendly rivalry. There's still a lot of exchange of information which, uh, you know, some of the corporate entities that fund some of the research projects of these mages are not really all that fond of. But it's really hard to not get together and, you know, have a drink, talk about this, the science of magic, and make fun of all those silly shamans and witches. Take heed, by the way, of the wilderness of Hessen-Nassau. It's hilly, it's foggy, and the forests are dark in this land. Rare and dangerous paracritters like dire wolves and venomous strixes stalk the night. But also, creatures from like the surrounding Metroplex areas find their way here every once in a while, and that can be a bit of a problem. From the north, some kind of a cyber, hyper, genetically engineered creature from a government lab might sneak in. Some horribly mutated super creator that was like fundamentally changed by biological chemical waste might wander in from the RRP in the West. And a lot of rich people in Frankfurt like to keep some pretty fucking exotic and dangerous paracritter magical pets that might at some point run away and find their way, you know, into this state from the south. Not to mention the failed experiments that the hermetics themselves like to just drop in their own backyard. Maybe that's why people kind of stick to the roads when traveling through Hessen-Nassau. The largest German state by area is the Norddeutsche Bund, which means North German League, and it's kind of more of a unitary association of states within a federalist state than a traditionally united state in the... Fe it's, you know, it's just a collection of places. It comprises most of Lower Saxony and Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, the entirety of Bremen and Schleswig-Holstein, half of the old Sachsen-Anhalt, and bits of Hessen and North Rhine-Westphalia. It also lost quite a bit of land to the Black Flood from, like, the North Sea, but, you know, that's just how Mafia works. Its capital, Hanover, is also the capital of the ADL of Germany, giving it double political weight. But aside from Hanover, and maybe the somewhat nearby to Hanover, over Bremen, which is severely diminished after the Black Flood, 
It doesn't really have any major plexes, especially if you move farther north, though it does have some small to medium-sized cities that act as islands of civilization, if you will. One of which, in the northernmost type area, Kiel, that's where I live, actually. There is, of course, a major sprawl right in the middle of the Norddeutsche Bund, but that's Hamburg, that's a legally separate state, and it does have a lot of influence economically on the surrounding region. And, uh, you know, not all, not all parts of the Bund are uh, as uh, united as others. There's a lot of places, especially along the shore of the Baltic Sea, that when they see Hamburg doing something like anti the federal government, they think to themselves, yeah, maybe we should form a new Hanseatic League. But these are, of course, fringe extremists that are not to be taken seriously, is also what they said of the Catalonian independence movement around the turn of the millennium, and look how that went. For being such a huge area, the Bund is pretty sparsely populated outside of its cities, of course. A big reason for this is that large parts of the state are uninhabitable because both the North and Baltic Seas have become uh, rather terrible places for life to exist, which of course has had a terrible knock-on effect on the surrounding ecosystems, severely dragging them down also. Almost like ecosystems are not actually like independent things that exist in bubbles, isolated from each other, but actually part of a vast interconnected and also rather seamless weave and in many ways very much interdependent upon each other. Many rich and influential people, especially those in the cities, have decided that when it comes to living in the middle of a toxic wasteland, it's in for a penny, in for a pound. So the Bund has become a bit of a dumping ground for all manner of waste and man-made horrors beyond my comprehension. This goes from just chemicals that should never have been created in the first place to j plain old just trash, batteries, electronics, plastic bits that are lying around, cans. It has really become the landfill of Northern Europe and that does come with the kind of depopulation that you might imagine following such a development. But hey, at least there's a vibrant scene of trash divers doing uh, incredibly dangerous reclamation work, shortening their lifespans by like a decade or more, diving through the trash of a whole nation. Plus, those great swathes of nothing are good places to hide spooky laboratories. There's a whole political and philosophical discourse as to whether all of these lost natural areas should be reclaimed through expensive purification projects, making them habitable again for animal and human alike. This is definitely what the general public wants, or whether they should just put massive arcologies where every step that every person takes is tracked by some like private data collection company and where it's virtually impossible to escape from it on account of being surrounded by a toxic wasteland and all of the transportation things that can go in and out of the arcology are also owned by the people who own the arcology. A and in these vibrant cities of the future you could house workers and then, then they would work uh, for less money and also in smaller apartments because if you give them nothing but the alternative of being set out into the vat to be consumed by a toxic insect spirit, the worker will take what the worker can get. You, you can take a fucking guess as to which of the g political groups with major influence is in favor of that option. But the bond is pretty big, so there's still a lot of areas that are healthy enough for agriculture. Of course, the wide open landscapes makes for some harsh winds that pelt the crops in ways that some crops just cannot withstand, but that's always been the case. The people of northern Germany just take it with the stiff upper lip attitude that they have always been known for, facing the slow abandonment of their rural culture with a shrug. Especially the Frisians were hit very hard by the Black Flood. Basically all of their ancestral homelands in like the Netherlands and like here in the Germany and then Denmark they were destroyed. They are just sunk below the sea level or are just entirely inhospitable. And given how integrated the Frisian people were anyway with the culture of Germany at large, they've all but disappeared as a culture save for some very small militant strongholds. In better news, I guess, something that's become a bit of a staple of Nordic culture is one of the coolest things in the Shadowrun setting 
Hoverball. You know how all of America loves like football and baseball, but like Wisconsin and Minnesota are just crazy about hockey? That's Hoverball here. It is the number one most popular sport. Not by a huge margin, Urban Brawl is right on there, as is the footy. It's a team ball sport played on jet skis. I mean, what else do you need to know? It's actually pretty popular in all of Germany and to a lesser extent Europe at large, though outside of Europe, very few people have even heard of Hoverball, which is quite frankly a shame because it is a team ball game played on jet skis. I mean, how, th that is the coolest thing. One of the, one of the biggest shadow on world building travesties, if you ask me. North Rhine-Westphalia, not Rhine-Westfalen, was before the great reshuffling of the ADL the most populous state in Germany. Now, after it's had to cede significant parts of its territory to other adjacent states, it still 100% is the most populous state in Germany. The reason for this is the Rhein-Ruhr Megaplex, one of the most industrially significant sprawls in the world. It's certainly the largest sprawl in Europe, stretching all the way from Bonn to Dortmund, encompassing seven major and almost two dozen minor cities. The most identity-giving part of the RRP is the Ruhrgebiet in the north, which has Essen at its heart. Famously, the headquarters of Zeta Corp Heavy Industries, perhaps the biggest mega corporation in the world, owned completely by the great dragon Lofir. The whole Ruhrgebiet was actually, once upon a time, huge into mining, especially coal, and there was actually a minor civil war pun intended, when the government came in to shut that shit down. Even though it's been almost a century, there are still very active socialist paramilitaries born out of the labor unions of way back when, trying to protect, or you know, at this point rather, revive those jobs. Because of its montane past, the entire area is intervened with a vast network of mine shafts, some of them centuries old. Those, in addition to various bunker complexes, are hotly contested by all manner of powers, big and small. Rumor has it that distributed throughout these shafts are the legendary 265 bombs, which are alleged to be highly sophisticated explosive devices originally placed down there by disgruntled miners that could, if they were all blown up at the same time, completely devastate the state. Nobody knows if they actually exist, but you can rest assured that Lofia is keenly aware of what his horde may or may not be resting on. But even if they did blow up, it wouldn't be the entire state, really. Bonn, the southernmost tip of the sprawl, the former capital of West Germany. Cologne, one of the largest cities in the country and also my birthplace. And Dusseldorf, the state capital, with its various different satellite towns and cities, are all located in the Rhineland. It is very much a continuous part of the sprawl, and they do all share the same economic circulatory system. Unlike other Germans, sprawls, or really most major sprawls in the entire world, the RRP does not really have a centralized government. These are all independent cities that legally still comprise independent entities from each other that have just geographically grown together. When it comes down to it, though, they do have a centralized government. That's the state government, which actually encompasses some areas that are not specifically part of the Plex. But given how many people live in the Plex, those other areas are hardly politically relevant. Every single one of these cities has its own little cultural quirks, its own little particular flair. And some of them, like Cologne and Dusseldorf or Dortmund and Essen, have fierce rivalries. They really do not like each other. At least that's the joke. There's rarely any, like, active violent animosity or, like, legitimate racism to someone to, from, like, a different town. And between you and me, I can say this because I don't live in Cologne right now, Altbier and Kölsch taste pretty similar, they're produced in a very similar way, but when I am in the Rhineland, I will own it in Kölsch. And only the Kölsch variants with the red label. 
Aside from Gafavis, that shit, that shit rocks. As you can imagine, the RRP is quite a melting pot, not just from various areas and cultures and people groups that have been around each other for a long time historically, but also from people and cultures and subcultures and nations and what have you from all over the world. There's carnival-themed street gangs, Kurdish militia groups, and Japantown so big and so well-made that you will feel like you are in the middle of Tokyo with some, but certainly not all, of the racism removed. There's even several endemic languages, or you know, not quite languages, like a certain group is trying to revive the long extinct Ripuarian language. And there's a local dialect that's pretty much unintelligible to like high German speakers called Ruhrspeak, which also every, like every street you go on, it's a little different. Every city has its own little version of it depending on what flavors that particular place. Due to its decentralized nature, the RRP is a unique mosaic out of like highly urbanized areas interspersed with rural and suburban places and connected with a vast network of roads and paths built over millennia. Seriously, some of the roads in the Plex were like actually legitimately verifiably used by the ancient Romans. And if you drive on some of them, you might get the impression that the potholes haven't been fixed since Roman times either. There's always so many alternate routes, there's always so many pockets to hide out in, it's an absolute paradise for go-gangers. It's also dense with awakened places that are of interest to mages of all stripes. Like Haunted House Fuhlingen, which many have not particularly successfully tried to make their home over the years, the Sri Kamachi Impal Hindu Temple, and THE Neander Valley, which in German is called Neandertal. As an interesting aside, many extraplanar entities, specifically fairies, seem to have a lot of business to do in the RRP. So if you really want every single possible flavor of thing in your Shadowrun campaign, run it here. The Herzogtum Pomoria, or Grand Duchy of Pomoria, has deliberately, voluntarily chosen not to name itself one of the coolest words in the German language. They did this be they, because they wanted to, they chose this. Even though that's what the region has been called for centuries, Pommern. The duchy is comprised mostly of the old state of Mecklenburg for Pommern on the Baltic coast, but its establishment was also about reconnecting the old province of Pomerania, part of which is located in- was located, it isn't anymore, in Poland. And yeah, there's just a lot of different versions of the same name floating around right now. You are not, in fact, having a stroke. Pomeria is a special kind of state that could only exist the way it does in the Sixth World, called an Awakened Nation. These the countries, or you know, sort of, kind of countries, that are explicitly governed by and in the interests of a particular metatype. Other such places are Tirnanog in what used to be Ireland, or the Ghoul Nation of Asamando in Africa. Like most of the Awakened Nations, Pomoria is governed by elves and four elves, a plurality of which belong to the Nocturni Metavariant, which are, you know, nocturnal elves, as the name suggests, that have just pitch black skin, sort of red eyes, and very short fur. The ADL actually contains three awakened nations, the other two we will get to later, but Pomoria still enjoys a special status among them as well, because they are not technically a state of the ADL, but a separate nation that is still part of the ADL. The federal government basically has no authority here. They're not even a democracy, they're like a feudal state with a nominal elective system. But they have a deal with the ADL that basically the ADL will handle their foreign policy questions and protect them from big-scale supernatural threats like dragon attacks, which do happen here every once in a while. And they're very tied in with Germany economically, which the economy aspect is one of the ways that they were able to establish this state to begin with. You see, between devastating ecological catastrophes, the Euro Wars, and like massive economic downturn, the people of Pomerania had basically all abandoned 
the state. There were very, very few people living here. And I do mean like maybe a few hundred. It is however still a little bit suspicious just how quickly these elven dynasties managed to pop up out of nowhere, secure the funds, know-how and legitimacy to create this sort of semi-sovereign nation state. The region has always had a bit of a Slavic flair but the ruling families, all of which by by the way, our descendant of actual historical nobility have really turned that up to 11. 11. <laughs> Elvin. 11. I really, I, I put that in the script, I, di I didn't notice it. And I am now realizing that it is just not funny, but it, it's very funny to me. <laughs> They've supported the reintroduction of cultural traditions that have not been observed for centuries and also made sweat of it the unofficial but Let's be serious, it is very much the official state religion. Svetovit is also not only a religion, but also a magical tradition that's quite popular in Germany. It's very focused on druidic miracle working and sort of worshipping the forces of nature. It's not particularly centralized or restrictive, and it preaches a sort of ineffable divinity that is inherent to all natural things. As a result, it is skeptical of, but also not entirely opposed to technology. But it's generally a very open-minded and tolerant religion, which is really not something that can be said about Pomoria, because them elves is hella racist. Seriously, the government actively publishes and pushes anti-metahuman propaganda, not even pretending to care about, like, metatype equality like many other awakened nations do. They use primo systemic racism to drive humans orcs, dwarves, and trolls out and get elven families in. Even though, especially with the younger generations, things have become a little less racist, it's st you still don't want to be there. Unless you're an elf, in which case, you know, have at it. And they've really been successful at turning their elf ethnostate into like a paradise almost. They have revitalized the entirely annihilated nature using magic and technology. Not just the sand dune ecosystems, but the Baltic Sea. And they safeguard that with big nature reserves. Most of the state is nature reserves. And you, you best stay away from them, because they have a special police force that will fuck you up if you go near. Like, they do, they do not mess around. But all in all, it's a small place with few inhabitants. Even the major cities are really just towns. It's rural, it's idyllic, it's the kind of place that doesn't really exist all that much in the sixth world anymore. Moving on to another sparsely populated area, the Sonderrechtszone Saar will only feel idyllic to you if you are a fan of Geiger Counter ASMR. The German state of Saarland, a little bit of Rheinland-Pfalz, the uh, northern bit of the French Lorraine region, and the literal entire nation of Luxembourg are part of the SOX. A radioactive wasteland created by the meltdown of the French Catanom nuclear plant, the worst nuclear disaster in Shadowrun history. An entire country just ceased to exist. Millions of people lost their homes. Nowadays, the whole area is leased out to a compact of mega corporations who are legally and internationally recognized the administrators of the SOX. They put up a big, expensive, fuck off concrete wall around the whole place, which is really a big place, and they have like swiveling turrets running around it on rails that will shoot trespassers on site. But why? Why would they do any of that? Why would they invest so much money to basically have shared custody over a swathe of land that isn't just inhospitable, but actively deadly? Well, in practical terms, the SOX is the largest contiguous extraterritorial tract of land on the planet. And the way that extraterritoriality is secured isn't just the flimsy paper of the law and maybe like a fence. It's a huge fuck off concrete walls with swiveling guns on top. Also the fact that the area is incredibly difficult to navigate, not just because of the radiation, but also because of mutated critters and paracritters, the utterly fucked astral plane, and not to mention 
some of the people who hang out here. The mega corporations who own the SOX have a number of top secret laboratories here where they do, of course, all manner of highly unethical research. Also, there's a bunch of toxic waste disposal sites, but you know, that's just par for the course, really. Roughly 25,000 corporate citizens live permanently in the SOX in various very secure and isolated arcologies. These are not the people I mean when I say some of the people people who live here. There's a whole pseudo-tribal culture here called the Radpunks. Most of these people just cannot exist anywhere else in the world anymore. They may have pissed off the wrong people, they may be criminals, they may be just people who cannot vibe with the rest of meta-humanity because their mind is so warped. Debt slave running from their collectors. Fringe political ideologies and religious sects. They all form this very complicated and ever-changing patchwork of uh, tribal fiefdoms. Certainly the most insane among them are the so-called glow punks. A bunch of like hardcore raider psychopaths Psychopaths, religious nutjobs, who worship the great dragon Feuerschwinger. Feuerschwinger is kind of a dark specter in German history because when the world awakened, magic came back. She just popped up out of nowhere and started destroying everything. And it took a long time for the Bundeswehr to finally shoot her down. And then she fucking lands in the middle of the SOX. Presumably dead. No one's had any official communication from her since, though I'm not sure her burning down a village, which is the only kind of communication that she did before that, really counts as being particularly official. If the SOX is a whole stalker shadow of Chernobyl type deal, then the Glowpunks are the Mad Max Fury Road crazy people that inhabit it. The SOX does nevertheless have a rather surprisingly complex internal economy, especially in terms of manufacturing things that are illegal outside of it. And even after all these years, there's still plenty left to plunder. Labs are still built and abandoned on the regular, and in recent years, the very popular format Desert Wars has been brought here to the SOX now called Rad Wars. It's pretty straightforward. You have a bunch of teams, aka mercenary groups, practicing war games against each other in like a certain area, trying to secure strategic targets. These are national militaries and these are corporate sponsored groups. And they use live ammunition. They like, it's actual for real warfare that's happening. There's just some rules. And if there's a whole section of mercenaries that's just been annihilated by a rival section of mercenaries... I mean, the guns are right there, you can just take them. And of course guns are valuable in the SOX, but a lot of the high-grade military equipment that gets left behind is even more valuable when exported outside of the SOX. And this is something done by the so-called Ghost Rats. A special class of smuggler that has contacts on both sides of the big fuck-off concrete wall with the swiveling guns on top of it, and manages to traverse that thing quite often, be that through like very low T-bird flights in areas where they sort of hack the guns, or the guns don't have really complete coverage, and there's like, you know, holes in the fence basically, or underground passages. All in all, I do not recommend that you ever go to the SOX for literally any reason ever. And if you do, make sure that the job pays enough to retire and retire well with significant medical costs. Because in the unlikely case that you do survive, you are probably going to need to retire, even if you are physically unharmed, because your mind will be wrecked. If you know the first thing about German politics, and you read the words Freistaat Sachsen, you know where this is going politically. Like, there is no good way out of this one, baby. Remember the whole thing where Germany had, like, a military government for a while? Well, they eventually, completely voluntarily, and this had always been their plan, made elections happen and stepped down. And, uh, the last part of that, the second, the second half, the bit where they don't do the thing anymore, is kind of something that only very nominally happened. 
in Saxony. It didn't really... It happened on paper, but it didn't really happen. And it's not like the population had a big problem with that. The military brass basically went on to just bide their time and be extremely influential in the politics of Saxony. And after the Euro War and Red Army occupation of the state, they basically went, look, the federal government, the Bundeswehr, they can't protect you. We are gonna do that now because we are the, the real protecting guys who or it failed to protect you before because we were part of the Bundeswehr. But it's different. They really loved the whole military junta thing, so they took some random third-rate aristocrat, arrested him off the street, and then offered him to basically become the Duke of Saxony. And he was like, yeah, sure, I, let's do it. And then they restructured the state into like a constitutional monarchy. For a while, the beautiful white halls of Dresden Castle became a hotspot for the international noble elite. Days and nights were filled with lavish parties, cultural expositions, and court intrigue. Of course, the military were the ones actually in charge. The Duke was barely a figurehead. Until his son came to power, who had spent, you know, most of his life living in the system and had for a long time been working behind the scenes at court to secure a whole new generation of military leaders for himself. These military guys had been drinking their own Kool-Aid, so he turned the tables on them and reformed the constitution of the state into like an actual proper monarchy where he was the king, even though he was still the, the title was Duke. And what he also did is he included a lot of like hyper-militarist, or shall we say, a little bit fascist ideas into the new official state ideology. So it's not like these military guys got a particularly rough deal. Individual rights were yeeted, the assets of the people of Saxony were acquired and distributed among the nobility, and of course metahumans were now actively being discriminated against. Dueling was also legalized for some reason, like not with Yu-Gi-Oh cards, but with weapons. Though I assume you could also technically do a Yu-Gi-Oh card duel. Bit of a silver lining, I guess, because dueling is cool. And you'd expect that the people would have a little bit of a problem with that, with this whole autocratic, aristocratic, strongman type deal. But it turns out the people of Saxony are culturally very happy to go along with shit like this. Almost like a fetish type thing. Look, I hate, I hate saying shit like this. I really do. I'm, I'm ha basically, half my family is from Saxony. Like, my mother, all her ancestors are from that state. But like, Jesus fucking Christ, you look at the voting record, you look at how they vote in real life, it just, it checks out. This isn't to say there was no resistance. Dresden especially has always been a neo-anarchist freehold. But they understood very well that they enjoyed no support from the population at large, so they focused on fomenting resistance and helping the people who needed to get out to get out. A big part of the power consolidation reforms was decoupling the military from the ADL's Bundeswehr. To that end, the Duke created a series of mercenary armies that would also bring in a lot of money fighting abroad. He was careful in how he set this up, like splitting power among many different such organizations, but ultimately it ended up being his undoing because they pretty recently decided to putsch and bring the state back to a democracy. Rumor has it literally the entirety of the ADL's intelligence apparatus spent a lot of time and resources on making that happen. So even though Saxony is back to being a democracy, its political landscape is made up of far-right extremists and monarchist sympathizers. For Shadowrunners, this creates a very interesting situation. Like any good fascistoid regime, the Duchy of Saxony was very happy to work with private industry, stripping any vestige of labor laws that still existed to allow them some pretty hefty profit margins and low taxes. And the corporation were more than happy to take that money. But something the corporations were prone to doing that Saxony really didn't like was shadow running. So with the suspension of human rights, they became extremely effective at hunting down and basically shooting on sight any and all shadow runners. For decades, despite the intrigue in corporate presence, shadow running was an extremely difficult, if not impossible, profession to have. Much of the demand for this kind of operation was covered by private mercenary groups that were very thoroughly background checked. But now it's open season. This whole time, 
Knowing that shadow running was a very difficult prospect in Saxony, a lot of big corporations placed assets that would be vulnerable to that kind of attack in Saxony. And now they can smell each other's blood as much as they're aware of their own wounds. So there's a lot of money to be made over there right now. Just expect it to be quite the frenzy. Another place that transitioned from monarchy to democracy quite recently is the Trollrepublik Schwarzwald, the Black Forest Troll Republic, in the southwesternmost corner of the ADL. It may be called a troll republic, but it's actually meant as like a awakened nation for orcs and trolls both. It just so happens that the king is a troll, well, was a troll. Equal rights to orcs and trolls is something that, by the way, the other metatypes do not enjoy, though they do have basic protections and they were never actively driven out by the government. It's not a country made for them, but they are welcome there. Which isn't something that can be said about all the orcs and trolls that lived in southern Germany. This state really exists because of a goblinoid genocide, you can call it that really, that happened in the southern states after they split off from the Federal Republic and all the basic human, metahuman rights that apply to everyone that were in the Constitution of the Federal Republic. The Black Forest had suffered quite a bit of depopulation because it became hella scary and dangerous to live in after the Awakening. Even without it becoming a guerrilla hotspot, the racism armies of the South were not really able to control the area. Thus, King Berthold I, who may or may not have been the great dragon Kaltenstein, nobody knows this, a lot of conspiracies about this, declared it to be a safe haven of, for orcs and trolls in all southern Germany and also the rest of the world. And he banished the corporations too, which they did not love. Though they didn't put up too much of a fight because it's not like they were being kicked out of a particularly economically productive or large area for that matter. It's hard surviving in the cold, dark nights of the Black Forest. Forest. It has that name for a reason. Not only does it have a very high background count and is thus brimming with all manner of scary ass spirits, there's also hellhounds, wyverns, and treants under, in, beside, next to every single bit of vegetation that you will run into. And vegetation is pretty much the only thing that there is in the Black Forest. It is, after all, a forest. Okay, so the Troll Republic doesn't actually cover all of the Black Forest, and there are parts of the Troll Republic that are not specifically in the Black Forest, but that is what happens when, like, politics and war draws your borders, obviously. It's hella dangerous, is my point. The Orcs and Trolls here don't live in lavish comfort. They just have a better chance of survival. Though some, especially among the magically gifted, have managed to thrive in this place, mainly by taming the will wilderness and beasts of the forest. Most notably, this was the Trollting, a cabal of powerful troll shamans who served as advisors to the king. But in terms of technological solutions, like what they did in Pomoria, an abundance of shotguns with enough recoil to break a normal human's arm was really as high-tech as it got. Especially because there was no money coming in, the area was very much on its own. Solidarity was the currency of this hostile place. But you may have noticed the past tense of that sentence, because the king is no longer in charge, though not for the reasons that you might think. He'd always had detractors. Most of the people living in the Troll Kingdom would have preferred an actual democracy. They understood that the pseudo-elections that were taking place were really only there to satisfy the king's grandiose ego. But there was no violent revolt, no, no assassination, no political coup. It's just that from one day to the next, he kind of disappeared. He was in the middle of the palace, surrounded by his guards and his courtiers and all of the fans and such, and then he was just no longer there. This may sound suspicious, but it, it did happen in 2061, the year of the comet, and if that means anything to you, as someone who knows a little bit about Shadowrun, you will know that that's probably the least weird thing that happened that year. His chancellor, Hugo von Haslach, took power, as was the law, and then waited a very respectful ten years before saying, Oh, look, 
It is a national day of mourning, for today we admit to ourselves that our great king is no longer just missing, but presumed dead. Because the king had no successor, and Hugo von Haslach didn't just want to keep governing in his place, there was a whole big referendum type deal on what should happen next. And thus, much to the chagrin of some very powerful institutions like the Troll Thing, the Troll Kingdom became a Troll Republic. And also much to the chagrin of the sort of autonomy first focused, uh, isolationist people, the economy was opened up to investment by outside corporations. This does, however, mean that currently, for the first time in a long time, money is rolling in, infrastructure is being repaired, jobs are being created. And also, very crucially, uh, everything is being catalogued. So a lot of Shadowrunners who've been sort of hiding out in the forest because they pissed off the wrong people uh, might want to get the hell out of Dodge. It's still not a super economically productive region, but I'm sure as soon as the honeymoon phase is over and the corporations that are moving in right now have like established themselves properly in the place, they will find ways of exploiting it. And I'm sure that the orcs and trolls who came here specifically to avoid that kind of thing are going to hate it. Moving on to a bastion of democracy, the Freistaat Thüringen is to some people basically the definition of the middle of Germany, even though it is slightly offset to the east, so geographically speaking, not true at all. But if you think of Germany as like facing space, lying on the planet, it, you, it would basically be around here, or to the left, where the heart is. And Thuringia is definitely the magical heart of Germany. It's full of practitioners of all kinds, and they hold a lot of political sway. Which, if you think about it, is very impressive for a state that is, for the most part, a direct democracy, given that mages, even though there's a lot more of them percentage-wise here, still make up a tiny fraction of the population. All this isn't just because Thuringen has a lot of magical hotspot locations. It's also a matter of local pride reflected in policy. The populace and the government actively supports magic. They love magic. There's a lot of world-renowned faculties and professors here teaching all manner of traditions and paradigms, even international ones. So you'll definitely find all manner of herbalist witches and hermetic mystics here, but there's also an abundance of voodoo mambos, tai chi masters, and powwow leading medicine men. There are some pretty elitist, reclusive faculties, but most of the others, especially the major ones, constantly invite guest lecturers from all over the world. And even the abundance of magical hotspots is partly due to policy. Urban planning is done in tight coordination with mages. Not only to ensure that they have safe practice spaces, of course, but also so the Feng Shui can properly flow through the landscape and the cities, and to ensure that the domestic spirits, which are unfortunately rather often overlooked, can thrive. Of course, this kind of place also attracts all manner of very fringe groups, like among mages even, politically speaking, though none of them have really been able to gain too much of a mainstream political foothold. The neo-feminist Blocksberg Coven can be found in Thuringia, even though, technically speaking, the actual Blocksberg, which is probably the most important, most powerful magical site in Germany, is just across the border in the Norddeutscher Bund. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have hyper-nationalist rune rites trying to reawaken the old king by Barbarossa from his slumber deep within the mountains to bring about a new German golden age. As for the non-magical population, they're by and large happy with this. Thuringia was one of the first states to ratify the human rights of metahumans. They have had rights for metasapiens for a long time. You have pixies, nagas, sasquatches, and a lot more exotic metasapien people, usually invited by the universities to teach. And though, of course, the economy is dominated by the international giant and like the local German heavyweights, a significant amount is made up of worker-owned cooperatives. They put they put the socialism in Shadowrun, they really did. And by the way, if you're gonna be Shadowrunning in Thuringen, which is very much a thing that happens here a lot, you better know a thing or two about magic, because even if your run does not explicitly revolve around magic, 
chances are you are going to bump into some. No matter if it's a frost elemental as a key part of a server farm security system, being assailed by a gargoyle in a telesmic museum heist, or having your exit unexpectedly blocked by a verbanist ritual, it's impossible to move through the shadows without bumping into magic. Abjuration specialists are part of every medium-sized police detachment skilled in counterspelling and spirit banishment, and if you're smart, you're gonna bring your own as well. Rumor has it some of the ones who work for the police also moonlight in the shadows, though usually in more of a consulting role because they, they kind of don't want to bump into any colleagues in uniform by accident. That would be a little bit awkward. But look, if you're willing to deal with the weird and the unexpected, Turingia is a great place to do that. Nice place to live politically and you can make a bunch of money here. Given that we're bouncing between extremes here right now, the Freistadt Westfalen in the northwest of the ADL is a place where metahumans don't just not have equal rights, it's such a regressive police state, Elves, in particular, are, like, specifically banned from the state. And they will come into your house to check if you're hiding any elves under the floorboards. The other metatypes make up, like, 5% of the population. Miscegenation is banned. The policing and security apparatus of the state is what I personally like to call overfunded and uh, rather prone to brutality. See, their police also has abjurers, but that's because magic is illegal here. With the notable exception of Christian theurgy. Which isn't magic, of course, but real, holy, sacred, divine miracle working for the glory of the church. Specifically, the German Catholic Church, who are the real power in this state. So in case you don't know, Germany and the Catholic Church have a bit of a history of having a history with each other. A couple centuries ago, a certain town not too far from here, a certain guy nailed a, a certain amount of theses to a certain church door. 2012 really messed things up for the Catholic Church. They were not ready for the emergence of magic and metahumans. This already very quickly led to a rift and split of the French Catholic Church, who didn't tow uh, the Catholic Church party line by saying, uh, actually, uh, metahumans are people, they're not demons, they're like literally... They just, they just look different. They're human beings. Until in 2024, the new Pope John the 25th issued the encyclical Imago Dei, which proclaimed that all metahumanity was made in God's image. He also allowed women to become priests and did all manner of very progressive stuff. He was a pretty swell guy for a Pope. Anyway, the Bishop of Münster at the time, Bernhard Freiherr von Heeremann, which it may be because he's like aristocratic, but the guy I was born in the same year as me, and I can tell you that Bernhard is not a particularly common name in my age cohort, though then, to be fair, neither is mine. He was outraged by this. And just so happened, aside from being an aristocrat of actual noble blood and a powerful bishop, he was also a very popular political figure at the time, making it all the way up to minister president of the state. So why not did he figure break away from the church as well as the French did for the wrong reasons. The priests under him basically commanded their congregations to vote for his party. Two of the three big power pillars of Westphalia were under control of ultra-conservatives. There's another column of power in Westphalia, and that is agriculture its main industry. The region is and always has been highly productive when it comes to food. All of the surrounding areas are very much dependent on that supply, especially now that a lot of parts of Germany are rather polluted. And at the top of the agricultural hierarchy are the so-called meat barons who own the meat packing plants. And get take a guess who one of the most powerful meat barons of the state was also. I it's Bishop here, man. It's, it's the bishop. It's the Guy did the thing, the conservative became president, also most powerful. He was that, it was him. And look, he was very generous to himself and his buddies in the meatpacking industry. 
with subsidy money. <laughs> Life in Westphalia was basically, for many decades, a very, very clean, sterilized censorship bubble, where you would get your news from the church feeds, go to the congregation, get mad at outsiders, hate them very much, have some strange constructed image of them that really has nothing to do with actual metahumans, and then be a good little worker bee in the fields. If a kid showed any sort of capacity for doing magic, the bishop's guard, a secret police working directly for the church would show up, take them in, bring them to some dark facility where they would be strapped to a chair and injected with fuck tons of specially developed drugs that would leave them permanently traumatized and essentially their connection to the astral plane completely sterile. Unless of course their parents agreed to essentially make them wards of the church. It was a draconian hell state. And then the year of the comet happened. Now, a lot of things happened in 2061, uh, but the one that most people think is the most relevant is Surge, which many people call Goblinization 2.0 also. A lot of people started manifesting really unusual traits, like, like strange skin colors or eye colors, uh, voice modulations that were unusual, pretty inhuman. And the degree of manifestation was very much a spectrum, so you had people who were growing horns and tails, and people who now had the ability to turn invisible, or had super strength, who were barely recognizable as metahumans anymore. Some did also, like, late goblinize, basically, into various metahuman types, but all metatypes were affected pretty much evenly by the effects of Surge, and the people altered by Surge are now known by the umbrella term changelings. These effects are enormously diverse, there seems to be no rhyme or reason to them, they just happen. And the problem was that many of the senior church officials became changelings. At least one of, like, the top-level bishops goblinized into an orc. Yikes. Oofy. Awkward. So Bishop Hegemann was like, yeah, look, listen, just because these people, they look different, and some of them now have, like, different physical traits, attributes, abilities, that doesn't mean they're actually different. They're still God's children, they're still the people from our communities. God is just testing us by making them look different. They're not demonic creatures, we still need to love them. And then he fucking died. His replacement was exactly as conservative as he was, although he also did a very, very strange, unexpected thing when technomancers started to be basically witch-hunted all over the world. When the ADL passed its controversial technomancer laws, Westphalia did as Hamburg did and decided not to enforce them. Rumor has it that this is because one of the new bishop's personal protégés was actually a technomancer. But it is also in line with the church ethos that technology is evil. To them, the emergence of technomancers was kind of like divine intervention. It was now not just technology having control over people, but there were people who, through their will, through their spirit, were able to control technology. So while, yes, uh, technomancers were not persecuted in Westphalia, they were kind of put into, like, re-education camps and put into, like, an, an order of uh, agents, if you will, along with some very elite, born-again Catholic hackers. And the purpose of this Order of Laodicea was basically to form strike teams go around the world and destroy artificial intelligences because, of course, those machine demons are dangerous and uh, cannot be allowed to influence humanity and so on and so forth. Even when they're progressive, they're racist. It's hilarious to me that they still- they- it's very hardline racist against metahumans, but there's now just like orcs and trolls living among them who are just straight up orcs and trolls but they're not legally and culturally that. They're, they're humans, so they're fine, but the other be- Religion, man. It really do be the way it is. Moving on to the third and final awakened nation within German borders, the Großherzogtum Westrhein-Luxemburg is dedicated to dwarves. 
And, you know, mainly because of, like, personal vanity reasons. If you've been paying attention, you will have learned earlier that Luxembourg as a country no longer exists. It's fully encompassed in a radioactive wasteland, and so all of the people who used to live there had to flee. Now, there's not that many people in Luxembourg, and it's one of the wealthiest countries in the world. So as far as refugees go, they were fine. One particular group, however, pretty much lost their entire identity, and that was the House of Nassau, the Grand Ducal family of Luxembourg. But they were, of course, unfathomably wealthy, so they just sort of bought a significant tract of Germany. The Eiffel Mountains, specifically, which, after a series of volcanic disasters, were considered pretty much worthless and unfit for large-scale human habitation. Only to, a few years later, when magic happened to come back into the world, find out that they were full of unfathomably valuable magical minerals, which boosted their wealth to, like, state levels. But it was the Duke's son Adolf, and I just, I genuinely cannot raise my eyebrow high enough at the idea that, like, these people, they came to Germany, they fled to Germany after their home was destroyed, and Germany was like, yeah, have this huge piece of land, just buy it from us. And then the motherfucker names his son Adolf. He was basically one of the first global high-profile dwarves to be born. But of course, back then, dwarves were still like a new thing. And so they initially sued the French government because they thought it was some kind of congenital disease triggered by the exposure to radiation that his parents had. And even after they settled and it became clear that, no, dwarves are just a type of people, like they're human beings that just also exist now, the French government continued to pay them like 10 million euros every year, which sounds like a lot, but really isn't. Adolf continued to expand his already enormous financial power base, translating it into political power through philanthropy and very specific targeted acquisitions that later turned into bigger acquisitions of land. He encouraged the population of diaspora Luxembourgish people, who, of whom already a lot of them were there, but also dwarves and metahumans in general to this region where he was an enormously popular figure. Couple uh, complicated diplomatic pen strokes later and he gets some parts of North Rhine-Westphalia and the Rhineland Palatinate to become his new neo-aristocratic awakened nation and is officially part of the ADL. But unlike most of the other uh, neo-aristocratic feudal states that are popping up all over the world, like mushrooms in this particular point in time, you can tell that the Grand Ducal family of Luxembourg has been ruling over a democratic country for quite some time. Because yes, while the Grand Duke is the head of state and the head of the executive, which is like a lot less democratic than Luxembourg used to be, there's also a separate legislative chamber that's elected by the general public, and an independent judiciary. Free elections, actually exemplary e-democracy, a lot of new concepts are being introduced then into the voting system and how actually the populace can more directly impact state decisions. But of course, the Duke is an enormously popular figure. Whatever the Duke says ultimately goes. And one of the problems that he's facing at this point is that he is immensely wealthy through like resource extraction and exploitation, but he is finding that in the long term, the region that is his seat of power is not actually all that economically productive. A lot of the wealth produced is being siphoned off, particularly by Zedekrupp Heavy Industries, which the Grand Duke can do very little about because Lofia himself personally pulled a lot of political strings to help with the establishment of the state. Taxes, especially where it counts, are way too low. The government budget is thin. They are poor. And to hide this, the Grand Duke continues to pump unbelievable amounts of his vast personal family fortune into the state. But no matter how rich you are, the personal wealth of a single billionaire cannot stem the enormous costs of running a state that is so bloated 
over budget and unwilling to enact the necessary reforms because they would hurt the rich. Because a lot of the revenue streams they just would not touch were revenue streams belonging to venture capitalists who had done a small upfront investment in the creation of the nation and were now expecting a whole cake every single day. Running a country is expensive as it is and one that's regularly plagued by magical volcanoes and like floods happening even more expensive. The capital, Bad Neuna, I don't know if you remember this, but last year in our real world, there were these floods in Germany that, you know, everybody learned about. It was huge global news. It was the heart of all that shit. That was Bad Neuna. This is pictures of Bad Neuna back then. And because Shadowrun law is so well constructed, flooding had also been a problem in the law there. So the future of Westrhein-Luxemburg is uh, rather uncertain. The Grand Duke dedicated his entire life to creating this safe haven for metahumans, a welfare state where ordinary people actually had significant political power. But he held on too tight to traditional outdated ways of achieving such a thing, and he bankrupted himself in the process because he didn't really want things to change. And now the vultures are circling. Especially Lofia and Zedekup are in a position to pounce on this place whenever it goes down in the moment of weakness. And they will do it. Let's be honest, that probably was the plan all along. And last, but not quite least, I suppose, we go to Württemberg. One of the southern states, uh, once upon a time part of Baden-Württemberg. It's not the most racist state we've talked about today, although, let's be serious, the bar for that is pretty high, but it is quite racist. It's certainly racist enough to be the state where basically, like, plans for pogroms of metahumans leaked to the general public, which led to, like, an insurgency of metahumans humans that ultimately led to the creation of the Troll Kingdom that we talked about earlier. Although, and this is interesting, specifically the giant meta variant of the Troll meta type are popular here. They encourage giant migration to Württemberg for reasons that I personally do not entirely understand. Metahumans in Württemberg exist in this very interesting legal gray area where they technically have equal rights to humans. But also, in factual terms, they kinda don't. Because in a lot of scenarios, specifically hunting-related scenarios, they don't count as humans, but awakened critters, so animals. So if you kill an orc because, you know, they're an orc, that's illegal. You go to prison, you've committed murder. But if you happen to have a hunting accident where an orc dies, you get like a fine for poaching, and a slap on the wrist. There's a whole industry of lawyers in Württemberg that basically specialize in reframing murders of metahumans as hunting accidents. Naturally, as you might expect, among certain segments of the population, hunting trips in densely populated urban centers have skyrocketed in popularity. Germans would describe the disposition of the Swabians, the people of Württemberg, as Deutsches Denunziantentum, which means that they are noisy busybodies constantly up in everyone else's shit to make sure that they are adhering to all the rules, laws, and regulations, and going to the police for every minor infraction that their neighbors commit. Oh, did you, did you hoover clean your apartment on a Sunday? What were you, were you listening to electronic music after 10 in the evening? You don't recycle meticulously enough? Expect a letter in the mail if not a visit from the authorities. It's not the state criminal police that'll show up, but some like private contractor they send of poorly trained, unaccountable officers to, you know, send a message. There's a lot of work for Shadowrunners here, provided that you are human and also the kind of person who can put up with leading a double life as a bourgeois spießer. Unlike many of the deeply conservative areas around the world, Württemberg loves technology and the Swabians are very proud of their accomplishments in this field. The dominant industry is vehicle manufacturing. 
manufacturing. Porsche, Mercedes-Benz, Zeppelin, which of course in the sixth world with its reliance on cargo airship is very, very powerful as a corporation, all have their headquarters and main manufacturing facilities in Württemberg. There's actually a nightlife district in Stuttgart that's like floating all the time on airships and it's like apparently quite the sight. But it's also big in the weapons industry, specifically small arms. You have Altmaier, Walter, Heckler and Koch. So especially when it comes to upmarket gear for Shadowrunners, it doesn't really matter where in the world you operate. There is a good to fair chance you own something that was manufactured in Württemberg. Now, to be fair, especially in the major cities, there is significant political resistance against the racism. And there are areas where you can live as a metahuman so long as you stick to your own kind in the eyes of the more rural people with the guns. Ironically, the least racist institutions in Württemberg are the mega corporations, And they're actually a very popular way for metahumans to get out of the state. Because, like, even disregarding how complicated it is to move to a different place, especially if you have no money, if you just take a car and try to get out of the state, you have to drive through the countryside, and you have to drive through one of the roads that people know are the roads that lead out of state. You are likely to run into some sort of hardcore Christian racist go gang. They will then stop you, arrest you, create some sort of impromptu trial that is very much illegal, but definitely tolerated by the authorities. And then they're gonna execute you for whatever made up shit. But if you're traveling as part of an armed convoy, many of the vehicles of which have the Horizon Media Group Group logo emblazoned on them very prominently, and perhaps also guns. Guns are helpful. That same Christian Go Gang is just gonna sort of avoid eye contact and drive past you. Now, of course, the mega corporations know this and they 100% use it as like a, like a treat that they can dangle in front of their metahuman employees so they can exploit them more. You might say that they really benefit from the racist conditions in Württemberg and have absolutely no incentive whatsoever to change any of that. Because even when they do reassign them to somewhere else and the metahumans get out of the state, they're probably gonna locked in in a terrible contract. But hey, I don't want to get sued for defamation, so I'm gonna leave it at that. And there you have it, folks. That's the ADL. That's the, the Germany of the sixth world. A wild, wonderful, diverse, and confused place full of different places and peoples, many of them struggling a little bit to still see the historical identity that has bound them over the centuries. A deeply troubled economic powerhouse of global proportions. Also, uh, my longest video ever by like a significant margin. I really hope this gave you some inspiration for your own game, whether you want to run it in Germany or just adapt some of the elements out of it. And if nothing else, hopefully this has satisfied the Shadowrun hyperfixation you might be having at this particular point in time or made it worse that's also possible and yeah if you'll excuse me i'm gonna go take a nap now just kidding i have a lot of footage to edit i need to get this video out before i go to visit my grandma in spain thank you very much for watching this video like comment subscribe share this to your relevant communities but do not spam them consider supporting me on patreon or subscribe star buying some of my merchandise or my short story collection and in that spirit yeah it's been a it's been a while. It's uh, I took a long time to do this. Uh, I feel like it's entirely reasonable for me to have taken a long time to do this. I don't think I'm gonna do a video of this size again anytime soon. Uh, but I do like the new long form time content that I have been making. Uh, it's been the algorithm has been liking it as well. I see that you people have been liking it also. Uh, so I'm gonna stick with it. See you around, cunts.